Hey, treat like the, just like, treat that like a sandwich. Go in there and get some snack. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is going to be, the next six months is going to be a hell of a ride. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to jump into the class right away because we got a lot to cover, a lot to cover. Uh, this class is a class I'm going to suggest that everybody uh, have pen and paper. Some of you may have to watch the class a few times to get some of these concepts. <clears throat> the goal is to Transform, transform. As you guys know that um, traditionally we've taught classes, but the problem with teaching classes is that um, often what I notice is that people will retain the information but don't have any context. So my goal in the next six months is not only teach but to transfer knowledge. And the knowledge I'm going to transfer is going to be pretty intense. Um, hope you guys are sitting down. If you guys are just not tuning in, or as you guys tune in, if you guys tune in late, well, I guess that's a relevant point to make, is if you tune in late, you wouldn't hear this. So uh, says, I said, I, I reserve that comment until a little later. Um, can we go to the first slide real quick, um, Shakina, Josh, first slide? I want to give a warning for this upcoming class. If you're not really serious about growing, expanding or building something, I, I suggest you just go and quit class. I know this is going to sound really harsh. If you don't want to change who you are because some reason you're baked into whoever you are, yeah, I think you turn this bass down some. Josh, turn the bass down the volume down some. But if you're baked into who you are or um, that you're scared to change or you find change as an act of uh, discomfort, I'm also suggest you probably want to stop here. If you suffer from distractions, I can promise you, you know, we talked about something in class that three most important variables in classes are for wait, 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 the, the principle of thought that most rich people hold on to is time, attention, money, where poor people focus on money, time, attention. But one of the things about attention is this. Poor people are often too distracted to work on themselves. Poor folks are often too distracted to work on themselves. People who want to build are often too distracted to work on themselves. And if you don't work on yourself, then the ability to build anything is close to impossible. So your life is just a complete hazard right now where you're so distracted and you're so busy and you're juggling so many different things. I think at this point your goal is to kind of bring some order to your life. Without that order, this next set of classes are going to go way above your head. Um, but I have taken the time to boil these, these concepts down, these principles down. I'm going to introduce a lot of new principles I've never introduced before. And I've taken a lot of time. I'm talking about since court been teaching, um, I've taken a lot of time to boil these ideas down so I can transfer them to you. Because a lot of these ideas, <clears throat> it's a different language. Let me let me shape you shape your mind or, or wrap your mind or help you wrap your mind about around what we're about to learn. There is a different level of thinking when it's time to scale any big idea. That form of thinking is not; it has its own language, it has its own principles, 
and it is not in the popular culture. A matter of fact, there is another, another, there are invisible systems that are working around us at all times. Let me say this again. And this is not spiritual. This is, this is just life. It's like science. Like air is an invisible system to us, right? Gravity is an invisible system. When you decide to grow anything on this earth, there are a group of principles and rules you must abide by to successfully expand or grow anything. Those rules do not care about your rationalization and your current beliefs. These rules have never really ever changed. These rules are often driven by human behavior and growth and system changes. If you don't know this language, people can literally talk about these subjects right around you and you have no idea, nor does can your brain wrap around, wrap itself around the language that's being used in front of you. You know, the old saying is, if you want to hide something from black people, put it in a book. It's not true. If you don't know the language, I can speak right in front of you. You still can't pick it up. If you don't understand systems, you know how you sit in a hood and black people claim that racism is hovering over them. But when you look up up in the air, you don't see a mothership. You don't see any white, like military person sitting on the corner reinforcing white supremacy. I would argue, and I will prove to you in the next six months, a lot of it's not even racism. It's the systems you don't understand. And the reason you don't understand it is because many of us have never built a company of at least a thousand people. We never built a company where it's worth billions of dollars. We never built a system that manages millions of lives. And so if you don't understand those systems and those ways of thinking, even your starting point can be skewed because you don't know the systems that will impact whatever you build. Building has a group of rules and principles. Now, when y'all see Court Smith after this class, give him a hug. Because you cannot even access these tools until you work on yourself. The first six months of this class has given you a key to access information that will change the way you think and see the world for the rest of your life. Now, if you don't want to change the way you see the world, I'm going to suggest you leave this class. Because I promise you, after every class, I, I plan, like they say in the 70s, I plan to blow your mind. I have no intent to just add information to what you already know. I have every intent to disrupt everything you know. But once you learn it, you will find different books you may have read before. Some of you may, most of you haven't. And you will find new books around business that will make a lot of books you've read in the past seem like jokes. Literally, literally like it's going to go from thinking the world was Disneyland to going to the real world. And when you get to the real world, if you don't understand the rules, then you will falsely create causations that are totally inaccurate. And you will think, and often because you don't understand, you will either blame yourself, you will even either blame other people that you're familiar with, when ultimately it's what you don't know. Once you change what you know, it's also going to re-engineer your emotions. So things that used to make you mad, you're going to realize how petty they were because you didn't know. And things you didn't think that were serious, you're going to see value in things you never saw value in before. Once you learn this language, it's like you're part of a new fraternity of thought. And I promise you, when I get through with this six months, I have a headache teaching this class. I spend so many hours just teaching the first three classes I've already planned out. And I spent the first three classes just Boiling it down, boiling it down, and boiling it down. So this is my warning. Once we go past this day, nothing in your life's going to feel the same. Your jobs, your friends, your events, your entertainment, your relationships, nothing's going to feel the same. And if you rather just say, hey, at this point, I don't want my life to change that much. I just want to be comfortable. This is an excellent time to turn the screen off at home. Or those in the room walk out of the class. So what we're going to do is going to give you a few seconds to ponder this decision. In the meantime, we know somebody. <laughs> Happy birthday, Court. <laughs> hey, today is Court's birthday. We got some cupcakes in the house. 
and we love us some court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Happy <laughs> birthday. Happy birthday, Court. <laughs> and also, I'm going to show y'all what I got in the room. So, if anybody know me, I love, hold on a second. If anybody know me, I love music. I love music so much, it's ridiculous. So everybody comes to my house, I put the speaker on Amazon, that's the most amazing speaker I've ever heard in my life. And so, I can't help it. I bought Court his own speaker for his house. It's a Bluetooth speaker that runs 24 hours. This thing bumps. It is crazy how well it bumps. And I got it on Amazon, and I fell in love with it, so, um, I was like, yo, I know I'm going to get him. It's like, you know, your grandmother gets you the fruitcake. This is my fruitcake. So y'all know your birthday come up and y'all be like, I know what it is. Yes, I'm the fruitcake uncle. So to you, bro, happy birthday. You want to say anything to folks real quick? Oh, no, you're, they can't see you over there, man. Don't be trying to. He, he, <laughs> that's a player. Right on, y'all. Thank y'all very much. Thank yo, yo. <laughs> Love y'all. Thank you. Appreciate you. <laughs> hey, and I'm. I, this is going to get put. To good use. Good, good, Thank you, bro. Good, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we have cupcakes in the back for everybody for his birthday to celebrate. So everybody. Oh, somebody say gonna play nothing but meditation music. But <laughs> but uh, you guys, uh, there's cupcakes in the background in the back there. Also on court, Shakira made you a special peach cobbler just for you. She knows that's your favorite. So <laughs> anybody ever had? Uh, Okay, Shabisha, close your mouth. Close your mouth, Shabisha. You're going to embarrass everybody. Because I don't need that evil look like... She's looking at you like you need to give up some of that peach cobbler. Anybody knows Shakira's peach cobbler is cold-blooded. She gets it from her mother, who gets it from folks on the, on, on the sharecropping. Uh, this is some cold-blooded... I'm not even exaggerating. Handmade from scratch. It is cold-blooded. So... Shabisha over there giving you a dirty look because she's had it before and she knows what it is. Uh, it ain't that it ain't that, that saucy stuff that we had in Tulsa, Oklahoma that was so bad. They sold us, they just they just took the, the peaches out the can and boiled them and gave it to us, and they do some bread or something in there. It was just the worst, it was the worst peach cobbler I ever had. Um but yeah, 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 you can shake the peach cobbler. It was, oh my God. So um, so Shakira uh, personally prepared that for you. And um so with that being said. Thank you, Shakira. Oh, Thank everybody you. online said happy birthday, too. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Court, Court, I really appreciate you, bro. Honestly, like, um, first of all, let me say this, because unknown to you, I get a lot of uh, beautiful feedback about your work. A lot of folks have talked about the classes you taught. Um, folks said it was off the hook. It was off the chains. Um, and don't think you're going to get to sit on the sideline the whole six months. You got that shit twisted. Um, but... Um, I really appreciate you, bro. I really like it. Like, like it's, it's, y'all don't understand how rare he is as, of a person that he cares so much about his people that he makes sacrifice. This man is busy. He's scaling his business. This is a lot of fucking work. And he cuts time out of his own space. And matter of fact, I'm going to teach a class <clears throat> about running a business and running a nonprofit and what are some of the big challenges. It's called drifts. I'm going to teach about drifting. And when we get to drifting, you'll see how much sacrifice he has actually has to make to teach his class. And so my hats go off to you in the deepest level of thank you, brother. And, and for all black folks, he's a true, true black dude that's serving his people and his community. Um, we love you, brother, I'm sure. And all the other folks who ride with us, they love you just as much. So appreciate you, brother, for sure. All right. Shabisha, you gonna do some reading today. Y'all ready online? Are folks already at home? Okay, this is the starting point. Now, for those of you just tuned in, once again, I would I would suggest you rewind the class and listen to the warning. The warning's real. I promise, I, I'm somebody who, I think it was three years ago, I, I had mentioned I was gonna start learning scaling. And it changed everything. It changed everything for me. And as I was sitting in class, my mind was changing so much that one of the reasons I, I, I decided to walk away from the first six months is because I didn't think I could be an excellent servant. Um, when you learn this next level of class, it's going to change your language, 
the way you see things. There's things you guys would say to me in the last six months, I would nod my head, but I knew you were absolutely wrong. But I knew that it would take too much to introduce the idea without priming the idea. And I knew your egos were too big to hear it. So if I would say, hey, that's wrong, it's you against me not examining the information in front of us. And so I work with Court behind the scenes to re-engineer new books for next year that are a little bit more robust. Um, and I work with Court to kind of reshape our thinking around some of the stuff we're teaching. We didn't teach you anything that was inaccurate. Not, there's always something inaccurate because information is always changing. But I will say this, we didn't take you to the promised land. And the reason we can take you to the promised land is I don't think you understand how far we are set back. It's not like we just, we're right at the, the starting gate and we just need the information. The trauma and the experiences of poverty, Jim Crowism, crack era, and slavery has even set us further back behind the line. And so first we have to emotionally get ourselves together. Matter of fact, in this society right now, trauma is, people are selling trauma. Trauma is a new hot value on the market. People run to trauma because that's the easiest way to claim value in society. That's why everybody, like the social justice movement, it's not really even anymore about justice for everybody. It's really about value me because I don't have what you have. And I need to blame the world because I don't have that. Matter of fact, one of the signs I can tell that you're suffering is you're too focused on what the world is doing wrong. When you focus on that, that's a sign you're going through something. You're probably, you're probably either dipping your feet in depression or you're already in depression. Because the other side of that thought is you're excited about what you're about to do to help, help improve the world. But when you're sitting around going, oh, white people are all this. And remember, mind you, I'm super pro-black. I'm probably a bit more militant than anybody in this class that's even listening to me. I was a brother who walked around with, before we had uh, digital screens, I had books in my backpack and daishikis on. I didn't do the strawberry sticks because I thought that was weird. But everything else, I was rocking. I was hanging out with all the, you know, from the 5% the, uh, the of Nation of Islam, the militant pro-black, we all rolled together really strong in a tight circle. But one thing I can tell you is that we didn't build anything. We were too busy trying to shame everybody into our belief systems, and we talked about resistance as a movement. Well, I will also make a case that that is not enough. I'm not saying that resistance doesn't have its value. It's just not enough. And so I, my goal is to introduce so many new ideas to you guys that I'm going to change the way that you move forward across the board. So with that being said, we're going, I'm going to also engage you guys and ask you guys to participate. So when we read these th information on the screen, um, I need you guys to participate in, in the process because I'm going to ask you guys questions as, as well. So before we get started, is there anything you guys want to bring up for the next five minutes around psychology of money? I'm sure if any of you guys got a chance to listen to that book, it should have disrupted you. Now, if you haven't been listening to the book, you have no idea how powerful that book is. The very premise of that book is that wealth is not driven by knowledge. It's, it's driven by behavior. And a lot of us think that because you went to school and you have numerous degrees in high education, you don't understand why you are economically underperforming. It's because you have behavior challenges. Totally different. And until you understand the connection between psychology and money, then you will continue to grind at methodologies that just doesn't work. Are you, are you using outdated models that just don't work? You don't even know that you should be updating your models. And so the psychology book around money is showing the direct connection. And, and I don't really feel like I need to teach this book because he does a really good job of, of making his arguments. So is there, is there anything that you guys want to bring up, anything online that anybody want to bring up around, even if, it's just, even if it's whether it's a question or something that was really impactful to you, I'm open to the floor for no more than 10 minutes maximum. And we can do this. It won't just be one weekend. We'll do this for a few weekends in a row. Um. Katie online, she said, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Turn, turn, up, turn up, Josh, turn up just a little bit for the in-house people. You know, Josh loves pushing them buttons. Go ahead. <laughs> um, Katie said, reading that book made me realize how important it was for me to read Emotional Agility first. Yes. Yes. Most of, okay. You have no idea how much 
So to get into this new dimension of thought, you have to. There's two things you have to bring down. Well, one thing you have to definitely bring down is your ego, because your ego will prevent you from changing your dimension of thought. You know how the Bible talks about being born again? That's going to another dimension of thought, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to give you a new dimension of thought around business, and in order for you to get there, one, you have to have your ego tamed. Second, you have to become aware of your emotions. Because your emotions will, your emotions hate uncertainty and change. Your brain doesn't even want to embrace. Matter of fact, this, this, this class is going to hurt your brain. This is why we brought pizza for everybody. Please eat. Because you're going to be burning calories in this class. <laughs> this, ain't, this, ain't, this is not going to be a fat man's class. Anybody else? Any comments? Go ahead. Um, f- for me, just even in chapter one, um, when he... Um, gave the list of kind of where people are. One of the things that I was like, wow, for me, I'm in this loop, this really a loop I don't think I've gotten out of, which is somewhere between scarcity and optimism. Like I kind of circle that and I don't, I haven't really gotten out of that um, at no income level that I've experienced. I, ha- I seem to, that, that is constant. The false optimism? Yeah, and, I, I, and like, over, and, the, over, yeah. and the insecurity, like I'm either like, I can do it. I don't have enough. I can do it. I don't have enough. So that is, I saw that like, damn, that's me immediately. Yeah, yeah. It's um, optimism is almost a filler for what we don't know. Mm-hmm. Once you can replace optimism with strategy and even knowing how to think and process it, mm-hmm. then you don't have to use things like optimism, gut, mm-hmm. feelings, inspiration. These terms we throw around all the time are the language of the helpless. We don't know where we're going, so we just kind of like, I just gonna believe I can get there. Why you don't get there? I don't know. But it's okay to say you don't know because then you can accelerate the learning process. But to even say you don't know sometimes hurt the ego. So we rather just say we kind of know and then struggle with what we don't know and then use these outdated models that keep, in, keep landing us in the same place we started or sometimes even set us back. And so the reason this book is so critical, like as you learn these principles, I would encourage you, if you finish the book, by the time we get to the fourth or fifth month of, of this teaching, go back and listen to the book again. You'll hear something you never heard before. A lot. A lot. Anybody else? Any other comments before we move forward? Go ahead, Lily. I'll be honest. I need help learning how to study and read because sometimes the audio books my brain wonder so Mm -hmm. it's hard for me to listen to the audio books um when i do read i feel like uh, my eyes get really watery and it feel like i'm straining to like read for more than like 30 minutes you might need glasses by the way too so okay you're young one of the that's me you're me when i was younger i used to be i wouldn't be able to read more than five minutes and go to sleep or i just what happens is the muscles of your eyes are straining. And so if you go to the eye doctor, you'll find out, oh, shit, you need reading glasses. Because mm-hmm. you can have 20-20 vision but have flawed eyes. But what happens is your muscles in the back of your eyes will adjust the eye. And when you're young, you don't feel it. When you get around 35 to 40, the muscle becomes weak, and all of a sudden you realize, what the hell is that sign getting blurry? Because the muscle got weak. But your eyes, that's your eyes have always been in condition. So when your eyes are adjusting to read, you, won't, you can have great vision. But, you, but the muscle straining so much is making you tired. So that's one. Two, audiobooks work. You got to find out what's the best time to listen to audiobooks. For example, if I'm driving in a where, where like I'm driving in East Oakland, I can't listen to audiobook. I got, it's too much going on. So, you know, three, there's a certain time when your brain is running really, really fast. You try to listen to audiobook then, bad timing because your brain is already having a, a conversation and then you're trying to listen to audiobook and you're trying to compete with your own brain. When you're doing something that's really boring, like washing dishes, folding clothes, washing your car, something that just like you can do without even any thought whatsoever, uh, riding a bike, jogging, those times have a tendency to quiet your brain a little bit and help you with your audio book. But if you're like at the gym, you're lifting weights, kind of hard because, that, you know, focusing, cling, cling, and oh, I got two more, and I, what number? Are like sometimes you, you have to count to 10, and you listen to audio book, you'd be on three forever. One, two, one, two, four, seven. How many have I done, right? So it's just like literally 
there's a time when you got to find those spaces. Here is a challenge for you that's critical. If you have never been successful, you've been trained to get used to being busy or distorted or distracted. Your distraction, you, your ability to control your distraction is a must. If you don't control your distraction, you can't change shit. You got to create spaces for your brain to slow down. Matter of fact, Lee, talk to Court afterwards because maybe you may have to use some of his tools. Court, Court has hacked a lot of stuff that I don't think you guys are taking for granted. I tease him because, you know, we're, we're different, but he's extremely right and extremely valuable. His meditation game has so much fire built into it. He's learning to create space for his brain to grow. He's full of chaos, but he learns how to stop chaos for himself. He's learned how to organize his life. Court has, Court has a very intelligent system of how he moves. And so many of you guys have heard him say it, but I don't think you guys understand the value of it because some of you guys have been cheating yourself, not cheating the class, cheating yourself. Deep focus and deep concentration has to be developed. So if you don't have it, don't demonize yourself. It's just like a new muscle you have to develop. And so one thing I would suggest, reach out to Court because I can promise you I'll watch Court move and he will move with speed and velocity, right? But when, he, when it comes to the time to stop, he has to stop on a drop of a dime and lock in. But he has rituals because he understands. One thing that Court understands is that you don't control this brain in totality. And so if you don't develop tools to help you gain deeper access to your brain, your brain will fully control you. Distraction is how you keep, how you keep everything the same in a world that's changing. Distraction is how you stay poor when the world is becoming more successful. Distraction is how you miss opportunities when they're right in front of you. Distraction is how you lose loved ones. Distraction is how you die early even though you're still alive. So distractions are everything. And so you got to become so in tune with self. Otherwise, when it comes time to go into defocus, because there's going to be some books that you're going to read, especially the book after this book that's going to require a little bit of focus. One thing I'm going to commit to is I'm going to teach you guys how to scale a business from zero to 100 between here and December. I'm going to teach you how to audit your business right now and what to do day one, day two, day three, day four, but how to think about it, how to structure it, how to audit it, how to manage it, how to see it. Now, if I teach you this, you're not going to get this kind of walking by class and listening in. You have to sit down and give some time to focus. If you're always running without focus, all you're doing is doing the same things harder, crossing your finger with optimism towards change. Change comes from knowing what to do different to create something different. Simple process. So Lily, first of all, and the thing y'all should learn from her, learn to ask those questions. I talked to somebody earlier this week in class. And they had the same question she asked, but they wouldn't ask it because it's concerned about how they felt, about how they would be seen. They said they wish they could be like her. The reality is that all you need to work on being like her moving forward. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break down whatever knowledge you think you have. I'm going to tear it down to the point you realize, oh, shit. If I really want to do this, I got to stay in that space for the rest of my life. Any, any false sense of confidence around any knowledge you have is your weakness. Any false sense of confidence around any knowledge you have is your weakness. Your greatness comes from your hunger and your curiosity to find more. That's your greatness. Your curiosity, your practice is where your greatness comes from. You are nothing without it. Yeah, are you somebody? Yeah, but will history remember you? If I ask you, what was a cousin of Michael Roy who lived in Wyoming in 1700s who was cousin to Lisa what was it? There was a nephew, son, and what was the most important thing he ever thought? You'd be like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" That's how the world will see you eventually. And so, at the end of the day, this world wasn't meant. This world is not your stage. This world, you have a relationship with to invest in and to receive gifts from. But it's not your stage. The world doesn't bend to you. You got to learn the principles of this world, and then you'll find joy and beauty in this world. 
This world's freaking amazing. If, you know, some of you guys are looking for burning bushes. You got burning bushes everywhere you turn. You know, the air we're all breathing right now is a miracle. The sun shining every day is a miracle. The human being can reproduce unlimited amount of times. It's a miracle. The beginning, the idea of the beginning and the idea of an end is a miracle. But yet, many of you guys are missing all the miracles of life because you're too much in your own funk. And so I'm trying to give you guys a broader way of looking at this world, step back further, give you tools I've never given you guys before, but to only ra to raise your thinking to a level that, that you kind of can move away from overvaluing and defining self. I don't understand why everybody, why, do you, why is it always about you? Why is it always about you? Once you realize the world ain't about you, once you realize that the world changes overnight. So I'm going to get you there. But this is going to be stressful. And you're going to leave here and get somebody phone numbers you can have somebody to talk to. Because if you go home and try to have this conversation by yourself, your brain is going to try to reject it because it's going to be so different than what you're used to. I'm moving you away from the axis. Here's the thing. I'm not teaching anything that has, never, that has not been here since man has recorded conversations and shared deep thoughts and ideas. These are not new ideas I'm about to share. It's just principles that's new to us, especially children of poverty and slavery. You've never heard this stuff before. I promise you this, and I, I, and I will prove it without a shadow of a doubt. Okay? First slide. Let's get into this. We're rolling. I'm going to open up sections. So write down all questions, and I will open up spaces for questions, and I will open up conversations. So every class, I'm going to commit to we usually teach kind of distortions around the retreat, but I'm going to take a little, a couple of kind of distortions each class because I see too many kind of, kind of distortions in the way we're showing up. Kind of distortions are critical when you're trying to implement strategies. If your brain is distorted, when the person, so as I said in the book, Psychology of Money, is that you can tell people what to do and give them information. This is, if this happened, do, if A happened, do B. What we forget about is what our brain does it once it, what, what, what does our brain do with that information once it gets into our head? We distort that information. So the more kind of distortions you have, the less accessible these tools will be. All right? So let's hit the first kind of, kind of distortion. Mental filtering. Mental filtering consists of two types of distortions. Both occur when a person focuses solely on the negative aspects of an experience. One negative men mental filtering is when a person focuses on the negatives of a situation and filters out all the positive aspects. They will magnify those negative details and dwell on those feelings. Their vision of reality can become darkened and distorted due to their focus on the negatives. This prevents you from seeing things clearly as you are focused on what's not working rather than what is working. Can you go, uh, and go hit, the, then hit the next one. So an example would be an employee who receives a performance oh. review at work gets a good review but focuses on one negative comment their manager made about them during the interview. Let me add another example for you. People out here killing each other. This is crazy out here. Um, you can't trust these kind of people. Um, white people are just racist. It's just it's bad out here. People are dying from disease everywhere you turn. Um, uh, did you hear about the, the people who got shot at the parade? They kill. It's just it's just guns are killing everybody out here. Um, you, you see the military filtering. I'm not talking about anything positive. It's what news actually introduces to your brain every freaking day. Anybody has any, does anybody have any examples of a mental filtering? Nobody? Go ahead, somebody pass it around. Go ahead. For me, I would say anybody that has experienced um, some type of trauma, uh, a lot of times we're often stuck in what happened to us. Yes. And we can't stop that play um, that tape from playing, so it shows up in all of our conversations as um, kind of like a victimized mentality. Yes. And um, one of the things that was funny, Albert and I were having a kind of a conversation about this today, 
um, that you really have to have um, an awareness that you're doing it and or have people around you that can point out um, when this is showing up because you get so comfortable in that space. Yes. Pastor Chris? Pastor um, at my last job, whenever we had evaluations at the end of the day, I would always gravitate towards anything that was less than perfect. And it didn't matter if it was 19 perfect and one that was off, my mind would gravitate towards that in performance reviews. It didn't matter the number. It was all about what was less than perfect and that it would it would shift my demeanor, my disposition, my approach psychologically. It it, it just it, it was just a horrible way to live and you could literally can get stuck and and just gravitate towards that direction. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? I, ju I just did it like three hours ago. <laughs> That's real. Thank, thank, thank you. First of all, that was dope. Go ahead. I um, had got a contract with a store, and um, there's a certain amount of numbers of jam that I know I have to sell per year for my goal, and I couldn't celebrate that. I told myself, oh, that's only one out of such and such. So, yeah, I just did that. Mm-hmm. Honestly, um, I've been doing negative mental filtering since 2016. Mm. And I didn't stop doing it until the last class I was here where y'all told me to let that shit go. <laughs> <laughs> and court, tell your sister to cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's just basically what I got yeah. from the, the summary of it. But um, yeah, so it's uh, you can get stuck and you can think that you've moved on but you really haven't. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so I'm kind of struggling with that right now. Like, how do I see, how do I look at that experience and see positive? Mm -hmm. And how do I learn what to take from it to move forward? But I kind of feel uh, like, um, I kind of feel like I'm struggling without a team. Because mm -hmm. I've been on a team my whole life. Mm -hmm. So now I feel like I don't, I don't know how to show up for myself. So when I need to wake up in the morning to work out before I go to work or wake up earlier to read or to do the little things that the daily habits when no one's watching, mm -hmm. I struggle to do that. But people assume that I'm so great at it. And I'm mm -hmm. like, if only y'all knew what I do when ain't nobody watching, because I don't really know how to be accountable or show up for myself. But it'll be easier to be here for y'all. If y'all like, hey, show up at six, I'll be here at 550. Mm -hmm. But if I got to show up for myself, I'll probably oversleep. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I feel like. The negative, what I've been doing for six years, I now I'm aware of it. I'm mm -hmm. just now trying to figure out how do I break those habits, and we I don't really know there. how to. We get there. I promise you. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Need some, Jabisha, want to say something? I, um, kind of similar to what Marquita is saying, like inability to celebrate any moment mm -hmm. in my in my life. I just yeah I can't see the line between that and bragging. It's very difficult for me. So to to be in the moment and just feel like it affects gratitude when you can't do for me mm -hmm. it affects my ability to be in a constant state of gratitude that's even practicing it um and sometimes i feel like the conversation of um your inner critic is so normalized to n to to have so it's like oh we all have a mental uh uh inner critic that's negative. I'm like, yeah, just because it's normal doesn't mean that <laughs> that's the right thing. But I, I really, really, I do not know how to celebrate myself. Yeah. I know how to celebrate other people, but not me. It's just critical. Shakina? Um, I was just having this conversation with my one of my clients because um, a lot of times in my industry, I think people only focus on the negative. Like they don't learn to celebrate the little wins. And she had said something to me. I actually called out cognitive distortion. She's like, what is that? And I was just like, you're only seeing the negative. Like, you lost 15 pounds. And, like, you cut 10% of your body fat. That's massive. But I wanted to lose 30 pounds. I'm like, but, you, like, learning to celebrate those little wins and, and, like, believing that you can actually do it because your subconscious is so much stronger than your conscious. Mm -hmm. I, just, I literally had this conversation today. Go ahead. Um, I was just thinking about my daughter when um, she comes in and she says, how do I look? I says, 
you look beautiful. She say, I know, right? <laughs> hey, don't, don't just say anything. And, and I laugh, and I be laugh. We bust up laughing yeah. because it's, it's, it's true, right? Right. But because of our trained mental filtering of like, you ain't supposed to say that. That um, you know that that we trained ourselves to downplay the positive in such a negative way. So like, it just all the way down simple of like, just you look nice today, or man, you look beautiful, or. I I still have a problem doing all oh, this old thing or oh, this ain't shit or uh, you know I ain't I, I got it at Marshalls for fifteen dollars I gotta say something no that's real to downplay it that's real you know what I'm saying that by the way uh, Dr Joyce DeGru says um, during slavery the reason like if you said if somebody says oh your son he's amazing the black mother would say uh, oh he's just you know he's a little monkey because she didn't want attention on her son because she knew that she could lose her son. And so a lot of times we shrink ourselves. Um, it's, it's, we gotten used to mental filtering, but let me show you two other, other areas because we want to keep moving. Two other areas of mental filtering plays a role. Um, one is kind of obvious. So as we hear negative information about oppression or things not going, like whether it's gentrification, whatever it is, we focus on the gentrification and don't see the possible options or what else is possible. Mental filtering blocks you from seeing opportunities. Let me say this again. So if you're feeling the blow of a loss in business, are you feeling, it's like, imagine if a boxer gets hit, hit once and he goes, oh shit, I shouldn't be here. It's a wrap. But next time, but if he understands, but if that, if that boxer can push past seeing the hit as a negative and see it as an opportunity for a counter punch or see it as an opportunity for him to make a, a punch the next time around or see it as a lesson to be learned, right? Or see some kind of positive from that. Or let's say he gets knocked down and instead of him mental filtering, I shouldn't be in boxing, he goes back and says, I got to get better, like Michael Jordan did against the Pistons, Right? Here's another area that you guys won't know, and I will bring this back around as we get to scaling. In order to scale a business, there's a group, there's a group of principles for scaling, but one of the principles in scaling is you gotta let go of perfectionism. In order for you to scale anything, you have to let go of perfectionism. Milter filtering is a snag in that process because when things happen, it will almost cause you to tunnel because you're focused on the negative, not realizing that in order for you to reach a level of perfection, you got to be able to accept the minuses amongst your team for over and have keep focus on the larger outcome of where you're going. So Milter filtering is for you to work on, but when it comes time to run your team, if you don't fix it, you can't scale. You just hear what I just said? So mental filtering ain't just about, you know, getting your emotions right and everything. You got to be able to build something perfect with a whole bunch of imperfection. You can't run a business by only having top trainers. You got to get C-level trainers and still provide an A-level experience for your customer. Because you can always hire C-level C -level trainers, but you can't hire, oh, you can't always hire A-level trainers. But if you focus on just mental filtering around the negatives, then you will look at your company and you start to start to move towards perfectionism. And guess what? You'll keep your company small. So mental filtering is something you personally work on to give yourself permission to be a leader of your own company. Otherwise, your mental filtering is suppressing not only your company, your team, and yourself. See where I'm going with this? Keep rolling. Come back to the tape. Next slide, please. Disqualifying the positive. This differs from negative mental filtering in that this distortion acknowledges the positive experiences but refuses to accept it. Disqualifying the positive is a complete rejection of positive experiences. The person will invalidate and ignore the positives while finding excuses to turn it into a negative one. This, this occurs when there is clear evidence that it's positive. 
So an example would be a student gets a good grade on an assignment, but the student overlooks it and tries to explain their good grade as simply luck or fluke instead of a result of their hard work. So disqualifier positive is more or less what the second part, which his daughter did, which is what black folks have done, which is we disqualify the positive, right? When you disqualify the positive, you also neutralize the world around you. If you, if you, if you automatically mental filter towards the negative and disqualify positive, the world's flat. It's hopeless. It's hopeless. That's a form of hopelessness. It's the beginning of it. It's not, it's not there yet. But if you practice, those two, you practice these two together, you're moving towards being hopeless because it feels like nothing's going to change. Like, what am I supposed to do? This, this, this alone almost speaks towards suicide. You feel like, where am I going to go with life? And we do it all the time because sometimes we become so goal drunken. We're drunk with our goals that if we don't see ourselves moving in the right direction, which I'm going to teach you how goals are a bad habit. You got to learn how to think about goals differently. Goals cannot be static. But when you think when you have these static goals of I want to get here and you measure yourself by those goals, you don't see progress. And progress is so incremental. Remember you said change happens in small increments? You can't see it. You can't see it. You can't see it. And guess what happens? You don't stay with it long enough. Because you can't see the small steps that are impacting growth. You can't take advantage of compounded growth because you can't see, you disqualify the positives. See, imagine you work out for, for six months and nothing to your body changes, but all you remember is the pain of every day. There's, there's change happening, but if your brain is automatically disqualifying the positives, meaning that maybe you walked up the stairs a little bit faster today. Maybe your ankles didn't hurt when you was dancing. Maybe when you had to pick up something, you picked up something and you didn't breathe as much, right? Those are all progress. But if you don't see that hourglass come back in six months, I'm disqualifying that positive. I'm mental filtering it out. And when somebody say, hey, you look, you're looking good. Oh, you know, I guess I'm cool. I, you know, I could be doing, I should be doing better. I, I'm, I need to work on myself. Guess what happens when you judge others? Guess what happens to your children? Mommy, mommy, look what great I got. Oh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. You didn't say it, but you just, you just disqualified them. You learn, you learn that it's like these two laws start to help you disconnect from life itself. The most important rule here, which you're going to learn about it in the night, is your connection to life itself. Many of us are used to living within our heads, not within the world we, we're actually in. So I'm going to pull you out of your head and put you back on this earth. I'm going to turn your finger from pointing outwards to pointing inwards. All right? Next slide. Overgeneralization. Overgeneralization thinking occurs when a person focuses on a single event that occurred and makes a conclusion based on the single piece of negative evidence. Since they reach this conclusion from the single event, they incorrectly conclude all similar events going forward will result in the same failure or negative experience. For example, a student receives a bad grade on one exam. Based on this, they think they are stupid and a failure and believe that all future exams, they will get a bad grade as well. All right, let's, let, me, let me set my watch for five minutes. I want to hear your guys' thought on this one. Hold on a second. Let me set my watch so I can, because I want to keep the time moving effectively because we have a lot to cover. Hold on a second. The thing that came up immediately was um, Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. and the way that, um, based on that, if you, if you look at news entertainment, <laughs> um, According to them, we back in the 50s, when this is terrible for women, all of these now bad things are going to happen. Or when Amber Heard uh, lost the situation with Johnny Depp. Um, now this is going to encourage more men to take advantage of women. And this is such a big setback. And I was like, this, this thing is now like all, all of it, but, but those are, that's what I think about, or those are the examples that come to Modern, mind. Modern day society talks in overgeneralization. Okay. It's the way everybody talks in the news. It's the way how most activists talk. They overgeneralize, right? Um, you're right. So calling out certain events, oh, this is going to happen because of that. 
but the way you do it locally is um, when you copy and paste these models of things that happen around you, that's a bad, that's a bad, bad practice just to copy and paste it. You copy and paste these ideas around you. And when it doesn't work, you go, oh, that just doesn't work. I tried it. It didn't work last time I tried it. What you end up doing is putting yourself in your own sale. You start telling yourself, oh, I tried this before. I did this before. It didn't make sense to me. It didn't work this last time I did it. Maybe you didn't do it right. Oh, I went there before. I didn't get that out of that. You didn't know what you're looking for. You don't look for, you, what you do is you just automatically assume, or you hear, you know, I don't go to this place because they say it's racist over here. Many of us have never went to certain places because we heard these stories, we overgeneralize, right? We make all these decisions where you can't answer the question for yourself, you just overgeneralize. You know, you know, uh, you know what black people do? Overgeneralize. You know how many variations of black people there are? They will call themselves black tomorrow, but don't necessarily agree with that idea. You just suggest it. I heard Killer Mike is being ashamed for supporting guns. He's from Atlanta, people. That's a different place than California. The game is different. Take your overgeneralized, generalizing ass and pay attention to, like, like learn to think outside of your box. Overgeneralization is almost assuming, like when people say, well, most people think this. What? I've seen that before. You know what that means? What? My father, my, you know, they say, white people say, black people told me never trust white people. What? Overgeneralization. We use it all the time, but all you're doing is locking yourself in a, you're locking yourself in programmable habits. It's your own mental cell. You're locking yourself up. I don't trust men. I don't trust, I don't men. trust females. I don't trust females. I don't trust women. Uh, looking at uh, black people who look like that automatically are doing this or that. You guys get on with this? Overgeneralization is just like I've done it before. Where I went to, when I first time I went to oh, last and first time I went to Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> food was like okay. The way you can keep me out of your state is just serving me bad food. So if there's anybody online that's from Memphis, Tennessee, fix your food. Don't get mad at me. So, so I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. And I'm expecting, like, I'm, driving through the, I'm driving through this one town, and all I see is American flags. I go into overgeneralization mode. Oh, my God. I'm seeing Klan on, old white women look like Klan to me. And it was my, but it was really my brain. The same thing happens when, for example, um, I was in a car with my son the other day, and I asked him, I said, um, hey, what do you guys think about this, these young people who are driving their cars and they don't give a shit? He goes, I only see it when I'm with y'all. I usually don't see it in my world. That's my overgeneralization of how I'm starting to reshape the world. As you age, mental filtering and overgeneralization starts to become, take over your brain. This is how you start to lock your doors and don't even go outside your house anymore. This is why your kids can't play in front of your house and you, leave on, you live on a dead end. Because your brain is overgeneralizing. You'll see something on television, somebody got shot or somebody got a car accident or somebody robbed somebody at a gunpoint. Um, when Trayvon Martin was uh, killed in Florida, people in Oakland were scared that their kids go in their car to go places. That doesn't even make mathematical sense. The problem with overgeneralization also, too, is the enemy of mathematical thinking, which you're going to learn a lot about. It's learning to see the world through numbers. You cannot scale anything without understanding data and the value of data. And overgeneralization has no value for a business person. Has zero value for a business person. Next slide. Imagine you have a family friend who's a financial advisor and he recommends investing in a retirement fund that isn't in your employer's plan. You have another friend who's fairly knowledgeable about investing and he tells you that this fund is risky. What would you do? When a no, no what, stop, I'll pause here. This is a true story. Go. When a man named Stephen Greenspan found himself in that okay, situation. Okay, so real quick. Y'all know, know who Greenspan is, right? Y'all remember the financial crash? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Nope. Huh? Right, right. So Greenspan 
is a major, major, major financial guru. Key Ray, it'll it, it, it tell a little bit more about him. Go ahead. Uh, so when a man named Stephen Greenspan found himself in that situation, he decided to weigh his skeptical friend's warning against the data available. His sister had been investing in the fund for several years, and she was pleased with the results. A number of her friends had been, too. Although the returns weren't extraordinary, they were consistently in the double digits. The financial advisor was enough of a believer that he had invested his own money in the fund. Armed with that information, Greenspan decided to go forward. He made a bold move, investing nearly a third of his retirement savings in the fund. Before long, he learned that his portfolio had grown by 25%. Then he lost it all overnight when the fund collapsed. It was the Ponzi scheme managed by Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. But no, no, it's not. No, you missed a point. Read it again because he missed a point. Do it again. From the beginning, or what would you do? Mm. Um, so imagine you have a family friend who's a financial advisor, and he recommends investing in a retirement fund that isn't in your employer's plan. You have another friend who's fairly knowledgeable about investing, and he tells you that this fund is risky. What would you do? So when a man named Stephen Greenspan found himself in that situation, he decided to weigh his skeptical friend's warning against the data available. His sister had been investing in the fund for several years, and she was pleased with the results. A number of her friends had been, too. Although the returns weren't extraordinary, they were consistently in double digits. The financial advisor was enough of a believer that he had invested his own money in the fund. Armed with that information, Greenspan decided to go forward. He made a bold move, investing nearly a third of his retirement savings in the fund. Before long, he learned that his portfolio had grown by 25%. Then he lost it all overnight when the fund collapsed. It was the Ponzi scheme managed by Bernie Madoff. Did anybody see what happened? Sure, could, 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 yeah, go ahead, Kaja. It was, it was good until it wasn't. Could pass, grab the microphone, please. It was good until it wasn't. So to me, that read that it wasn't intrinsically bad in totality. It was okay. Maybe he just didn't pull out soon enough because there was a return. It's just that the ret it went long enough to fall victim to the scheme. No, no, he missed it. Somebody else grab the microphone. He missed it. Okay, what I see there is it seems like he was influenced by what other people around him were doing. But 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 did you notice how pop? But what did he write before that? He wrote a book. Did he say did he say that part? He had wrote a book previously. By the way, let me see. Is it in there? Okay, okay. So Mr. Greenspan wrote a book about how not to be duped in the market. Mm -hmm. A thorough book that came out right before. This happened to him. Mm. But why didn't he follow the steps? That's the that's the that's the question. That's the question. We got a new hand. Let's get a new hand in the conversation. Uh, it seems like he over -general generalized, right? That's one. That's definitely a, definitely there. But but what else happened there? Um, he accepted social proofing from his close friends and family and didn't actually check on data as opposed to, oh, it works for them and maybe it'll work for me. And just because of a short-sighted increase, he dumped a large percentage of his resources into something that wasn't sure that was already high risk. Mm -hmm. One more. That's, that's, that's added to it. Go ahead. Anybody else? Oh, was yours? Okay. So let's, let, me, let, me, let me... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it also sounded like he... Didn't look at the data that the, uh, what is it, the friend talked about being risky, that he had stacked his scope of data review, like the, review, the scope of his data, to um, be in favor of people who he cared for. So I feel like he ignored a whole other set of data that perhaps the friend uh, <coughs> alluding to. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, and it seemed like he just asked people who was already with the fund, like he didn't, he didn't look at the other side of it, like he didn't, yeah. So what he's also highlighting to all of us, and I think you guys are kind of circling around the same point. Many of us think 
through tools of popularity, important people, popular trends, we don't know how to think for ourselves. This new journey you're about to go on is going to take you away from the popular ways of thinking. So go to the next slide real quick. Go ahead. We'll just read this real quick. Thinking and rethinking. Most of us take pride in our knowledge and expertise and in staying true to our beliefs and opinions. That makes sense in a stable world where we get rewarded for having conviction in our ideas. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we live in a rapidly changing world where we need to spend as much time rethinking as we do thinking. Rethinking is a skill set, but it's also a mindset. We already have many of the mental tools we need. Unfortunately, when it comes to our knowledge and opinions, we often favor feeling right over being right. He favored feeling right over being right. That is his ego run amok. So <clears throat> the key word here is rethinking. Many of us are in this class trying to find new knowledge to enhance our thinking, to add to our thinking. I would almost challenge that many of you guys need to go back and start practicing rethinking. Things you think you already knew, know should be challenged. Things you think you already know, because some of you guys are trying to make cake with poison. With poison, You don't realize a lot of your old ideas are horrible ideas, and you're trying to make them work with these new ideas. All ideas need to be challenged. But some of you protect those ideas because you rather feel right than be right. So if somebody challenges your idea, you don't go, huh, that's a good that's a good point. Let me think about that again. Or how do I know that's true? We rather feel right than be right. And what you'll find is that you have more legacy thoughts in your mind than new thoughts you are accumulating. And a lot of those legacy thoughts have to be challenged. Let's say your idea was correct today. But two days from now, it's no longer correct anymore. Things have changed in the world. If you don't practice rethinking, you become outdated overnight. Your business needs to function as a rethinking machine at all times because things are changing around it at all times. Business is not an act of stability functioning in a space that's not moving or changing. It has to constantly change with everything around it. So whatever you know, there's things you know that was true when you learned it that as of today, it is outdated. Some of you guys are taking elementary thoughts and trying to function in a college environment. And you wonder why you're underperforming. It's because you're taking, you have so many elementary approaches. And you don't even know to rethink because you practice just adding, 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 adding. And you have these core beliefs that you never sat down and said, let me just rethink it. Let me ask, let me challenge myself. Become interrogate your own beliefs. Stop spending time trying to create value around your beliefs. What I mean by creating value around your beliefs, you protect your beliefs, you define your beliefs of being you, you say I align with others who have the same beliefs, you build a whole world that supports this belief, and that belief has already changed. You are in a game of changing beliefs, upgrading beliefs, swapping beliefs. Because at this point, you are trying to be optimal, not the same. In a world that's always changing, being the same is going backwards. This is again, in a world that's always changing, being the same is going backwards. What is, is going backwards. Guys got that so far? Let's keep rolling. Next slide. My slide person. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so now we're going to pause on that. So just stay, because before we go to this next concept, because I'm going to hit this next one, the preacher, prosecutor, and the politician. Before I hit the preacher, prosecutor, and politician, this whole next six months is going to be about rethinking. I'm going after your core beliefs. I'm not going after the little cute stuff. This is not, this is not landmark and this is not uh, the Tony Robbins where we all get to talk about, yeah, I got that, that sounds so great, and I applaud that. That's not what I'm going, I'm going after your core. 
And that means that if you're just trying to add information to this class, next six months won't make any sense to you. If you're not prepared to rethink your ideas, it's the wrong place for you. This is not a place to reinforce who you are. This is a place to give yourself permission to be whoever you want to be. All right? Let's go into this new concept. There's another concept. We're jumping concepts, so we're on to another concept. We already hit about five concepts. So I hope you guys are taking notes, and if you need to, go back and read. Look over to class. Next, next concept. Let's go. I'm going to go with re-listen to class. Yeah, you probably will, because I'm, I'm, bringing, I'm bringing heat on purpose, <laughs> because I want to flood, flood, and you pick and choose what you need, and you go back and get more. Yeah. And as you take more and more classes, as you stay with this class, as you stay with the process, they start to bake in. So to don't, don't beat yourself up if you don't get it all in one day or one night. The goal is to disrupt your core ways of thinking. Go to the next one. Preachers, prosecutors, and politicians. Phil Tetlock discovered something peculiar. As we think and talk, we often slip into the mindsets of three different professions, preachers, prosecutors, and politicians. In each of these modes, we take on a particular identity and use a distinct set of tools. We go into preacher mode when our sacred beliefs are in jeopardy. So real quick, so when you think you're, you're, you're for example, when you think your beliefs are in jeopardy, you become a preacher. No, 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 uh, no pun intended, Pastor Chris. But you become, <laughs> you become a preacher because at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is you're in protection mode. Keep going. We deliver sermons to protect and promote our ideals. We enter prosecutor mode when we recognize flaws in other people's reasonings. So when we're trying to spread our beliefs, as flawed as they are, we're not trying to align with truth. We're trying to prosecute other people's weaknesses to, to force our beliefs on others. Keep going. We marshal arguments to prove them wrong and win our case. We shift into politician mode when we're seeking to win over an audience. We campaign and lobby for the approval of our constituents. The risk is that we become so wrapped up in preaching that we're right, prosecuting others who are wrong, and politicking for support that we don't bother to rethink our own views. You hear that? This is why we can't rethink. We're too protective. We, we go into preacher, prosecution, and po preacher, prosecutor, and politician mode. Politician, hey, Corey, come over here. Come over here. Am I right? Tell, tell Josh I'm right. Everybody says that. If it, if, if it, don't, if it, if, if it don't fit, you must have quit. <laughs> right? we, we do these things all the time where we build all these cool sayings and we use charisma to shout people down or we look for flaws in their logic that enter our flaw logic. And all we're doing is just changing flaw logic back and forth, back and forth. Right? And here's the other thing. We're not letting anything in. We become master arguers or masters at arguments, but we're not letting any information in. Your job is not to overprotect a belief. Beliefs are designed to be interchanged. They're not designed to become like uh, Mount Rushmore. You're not just trying to like carve an idea and it stays up there until the next generation shows up. They're designed to be exchanged. And so we go into this mode here, and this is a, you're going to see this, this mode come up a lot as we move forward, how people go into preacher mode, how they're going to go into prosecutor mode, how they're going to go into politician mode, right? And these forms of thinking, you see it everywhere you turn. This is popular culture, everywhere you turn. And all of us are guilty of doing it. But at some point, you have to learn to let that go to let something in. To let that go to let something in. We're going to keep going. I'm, I'm moving kind of fast. Next. This is where you want to go. Think like a scientist. But being a scientist is not just a profession. It's a frame of mind, a mode of thinking that differs from preaching, prosecuting, and politicking. We move into scientist mode when we're searching for the truth. We run experiments to test hypotheses and discover knowledge. So... Where are you about to go, a lot of times scientists get a bad name, not because of scientists. Most of the time, it's really because of the media's interpretation of what a scientist is. What a scientist really is, is somebody who's trying to discover knowledge. And they run tests on ideas that they receive. This right here is at the heart 
of getting out of sight of your own head. If you don't think like a scientist, you are trapped in your own head. When you're doing the preacher, prosec uh, prosecutor, and politician role, you're too busy trying to defend, and then you're keeping yourself in the same space. In order for you to become something different and have different experiences and have a different life, that means that you're going to have to practice the art of looking for the truth, always seeking truth, curious, hungry, playing around with stuff, hypothesis, discovering new knowledge. Anytime you hear something that somebody says that you never heard before, you should become curious, not defensive. Many of us, I've been told our whole life, black folks, I told you, black folks, and I can't speak for other races, but I know black folks and mainly poor people, we're defensive people. That's why we talk about defense, defense, defense. We don't know offense. I'm shifting to the offensive side. At some point, you got to score. Okay, you can't grab the ball and be like, yeah, nobody can get it and, and, and run the clock out. You got to score. So if you're going to move from the defensive plane to the offensive side, you got to turn your personal defense down. If I say, Shabisha, I think that's a bad idea, you can't go into the mode, well, why? Because I da -da -da -da, now you're going to start preaching, and then you're going to then you're gonna start prosecuting. Well, what about when you said, and matter of fact, and when I talk to Shakira, now you're a politician. Sorry. Right? You don't tap into the lobbying. Sorry. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that, but yet, instead of you going, huh, why do I feel uncomfortable with what he just said? Huh, could he be true? Could he be right? Can your truth withstand the comments? If it can't withstand the comments, maybe that truth is trying to rethink that idea. You see how this rethinking, thinking thing happens and how you're designed by larger picture culture, especially if you come from poverty, to protect that because you think you are your beliefs and your beliefs become personal? Oh, I respect this belief. That's personal. Move, 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 if, you, if you hang out with people who are performing, their beliefs are no longer personal. It's not personal. They're dumping ideas so fast to make your head spin. You see on news all the time where people are changing ideas and you call that fragile. It's okay. Go to the next slide. Mental models. I don't want to be a great... So before we go, okay, so real quick. These oh. are all connected. Now we're jumping into the mental model book. So this, those of you who've been reading mental model books, I'm going to jump into this. So this is all connected, but I'm just kind of leading you into the next thought. Go to the next one. It's mental models. I don't want to be a great problem solver. I want to avoid problems. So let me, let me say this real quick. That statement, as simple as it is, is a mindset. Many of us are used to being problem solvers. None of us ever thought about being problem avoiders. Mm -hmm. You can live a life where you start to avoid problems. Many of us let the problems happen, then we, then we pride ourselves on our ability to solve the problem. We don't realize the cost of that. There's cost in collisions. Collisions cost. At some point, you have to learn how to avoid the collisions. You're not in the business. When you're in the business of building and scaling, you're not in the business of collisions. Yes, you can solve problems, but you really want to avoid problems. Keep going. We'll come back. Just write your question down. We'll come back. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I want to avoid problems, prevent them from happening, and doing it right from the beginning. Go ahead. So how can we do things right from the beginning? We must understand how the world works and adjust our behavior accordingly. Okay. This is what the next six months is going to be about. That statement right there alone. Many of us are suffering because of the world we live in our head, not the world that's around us. If you want to be a problem avoider, if you become, if you become knowledgeable on how the world works, you can adjust yourself before the collision is necessary. The reason many of you guys are falling into collisions is because you won't let your belief go. Your beliefs are your collisions, more collisions. There's more collisions because of your beliefs than just, just circumstances. Like things happen, right? You can't avoid everything, right? Like you don't control the world. You're not God. But many of us are having more collisions because of the way we interpret the world, not because of the way the world runs. And so once you can change the way you interpret the world, you know how to position yourself accordingly to maximize the outcome. So now you're a problem avoider, 
not a problem solver. You will always be a problem solver, but your focus is going to be a problem avoider. Go ahead. Contrary to what we're led to believe, thinking better isn't about being a genius. It's about the processes we use to uncover reality and the choices we make once we do. That's, so school has sold us a, a distortion. The smartest person is going to win. You look at the grade game and you look at the successful performance game, it doesn't line up. And so what you realize is that this is now kind of talking about wisdom. We're moving away from um, content and we're moving into context. Keep going. Our failures to update from interacting with reality spring primarily from three things. Not having the right perspective or vantage point, ego-induced denial, and distance from the consequences of our decisions? Um, okay, let's, 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 let's jump into it. So, so those, okay, so we're gonna jump into those. Our failures to update from interacting with the reality springs from primary, springs primarily from three things, not having the right perspective or vantage point, ego-induced denial, and distance from our consequences of our decision. So, um, Having the right perspective, I'll explain that. I didn't, I didn't copy and paste that one, but let me explain the right perspective. So perspective is this, that we use that example, if a fish had, if a fish was in the water and they watched the boat go by and had x-ray vision, this, they say this in the book, and the fish can watch a person bouncing the ball at the bottom of the boat. Every time he bounces the ball, the person can't even tell you the boat is moving, right? Because the ball, the person is moving at the same velocity, so it seems that the ball is just going up and down. The fish is watching the boat the boat pass him at a certain speed. The person who's in front of the boat that the boat is coming straight after thinks the boat is moving so crazy fast, it's insane. And the person on the shore will tell you that boat's actually moving pretty slow, right? They're all accurate, but they're all coming from different perspectives, right? So ultimately, a lot of times our knowledge of the world is distorted because we don't understand how perspectives in, impact the way we see the world. One of the reasons, like for example, when when the mass thing happened in, in America around COVID, the reasons there were so many different arguments around the mass because there were so many different perspectives. So when people who wore masks said, I don't understand why people are not wearing masks, it's because they didn't see the perspective of the people who didn't wear masks. They didn't see the reality of the world that they live in. People live in so many different realities that your perspective is your limitation. Your perspective is your limitation. There's tools human beings have to use to get around your own perspective, but what human beings do is think that our perspective is reality. Your perspective is not reality. It's your reality based upon your circumstances. Somebody born in a different, in a different part of the land, even down the street, with different circumstances, have a different perspective, and theirs is true just like yours, even though they're opposites. Opposite ideas both can be true if you change the perspective. So write this down. Opposite ideas both can be true if you change the perspectives. This is going to come, this will come back to bite you so many times as we get deeper into these lessons. Perspectives are everything. Everything. This will, teach, this will teach you to stop arguing you right with people and start to look for the perspective differences. Once again, going back to thinking and rethinking and protecting your beliefs. If I'm challenging Kaja about her beliefs versus my beliefs, it is more important for me to understand her perspectives before I even start to discuss what is possible between our two beliefs. You understand that? If you, if you skip the perspectives, you're operating in a space of ignorance. If you skip the perspective, you're operating in a space of ignorance. Next slide. He goes that old ego again. The second flaw. Go ahead. Many of us tend. No, no, no. Read the read the read the, high, the header. The header. Okay. The second flaw is ego. Can I get applause for um, court? Can somebody, can, can I get applause for court? Thank you. I don't think you guys understand how much game he was giving you. The second flaw is ego, and I promise you, it is off the chains. Go ahead. Many of us tend to have too much invested in our opinions of ourselves to see the world's feedback. Okay, say so again, read that, read that line. Because I think, um, you know, uh, um, 
Shikina, her ears listen in Japanese sometimes, so if you say it too fast, she'll hear the wrong language. Read that same line again. Many of us tend to have too much invested in our opinions of ourselves to see the world's feedback. Hey, hey, Josh. Game. Okay, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> the feedback we need to update our beliefs about reality. This creates a profound ignorance that keeps us banging our head against the wall over and over okay, again. Okay, read that. We go back to be after the, the, the world, see the world feedback, and read it again. The feedback we need. To, the feedback we need to update our beliefs about reality. This creates a profound ignorance that keeps us banging our head against the wall over and over again. Our inability to take feedback because of our ego keeps us in a profound ignorance that keeps us banging our head against the wall over and over and over again. This is why some people could never escape poverty. This is why some people could never escape the, the story that happened to their mothers, their fathers, their community. This is why we cannot build to go back and save our community because we're victim to the same stuff our community's victim to. Because we can't receive ego, I mean feedback because our ego blocks it. Mm -hmm. I, guess, I, I want you guys to understand how powerful this is. Like, you guys, everybody's been running around trying to figure out how to change the world, how to change the hood, how to change the situation, how to change it, the relationships, the dynamics, the status of, of culture. And the, the, the trick and the secret has always been us and our ego. Once you get ego out the way, you can start changing levels and going anywhere you want to go. But you got to hear others to see yourself. You cannot see yourself by yourself. You cannot see yourself in secrecy. You cannot see yourself in secrecy. You cannot see yourself in secrecy. Many of us want to try to analyze ourselves in secrecy. All your brain is going to do, your brain is a cold, is a cold mother. I'm, I'm just talking about your brain. <laughs> and your brain will literally lie to you like you've never been lied to before. There's no better pimp than your brain. Your brain is the coldest pimp you've ever, look, Goatee ain't got a chance against your brain. That's a true Mac. And so what I'm trying to explain to you guys is that you guys have no idea that secrecy is your enemy. Go ahead, next, keep writing, keep writing, keep reading. Our inability to learn from the world because our ego happens for many reasons, but two are worth mentioning here. First, we're so afraid about what others will say about us that we fail to put our ideas out there and subject them to criticism. Wait, 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 wait. Did they write that? Did the person? Did somebody in class write that? Because that's, that's what this class functions as. Every class, somebody pulls me aside and says, "Nana, how come people are not talking in class?" So read that. Read that last one. Uh, start from um, first. 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 Yes. First, we're so afraid about what others will say about us that we fail to put our ideas out there and subject them to criticism. Uh, Lily, that, that ain't for you, Lily. That's for everybody else. So anyway, what I'm saying is that um, this is your ego that stops you from asking questions that you want to try to corner me later on and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation as if I'm going to save you as a personal guru when it's never been me, it's always been you. You're too scared because you think whatever happened to you is you're special. God chose you and somehow you failed the world and now the world was doomed because you were the only person that was called to be here. you Jesus number two. I don't think you understand how your brain is lying to you so cold. That pimp got you wrapped up thinking you the sweetest thing ever. Ain't nobody sweeter than you, baby. I just need you to just do this work. Just keep your mouth closed and do what I say, baby. We can go to the end of the world. And that's what y'all do in class. Y'all just, okay, daddy, I ain't going to say nothing. I really want to ask him something, but I'm going to wait till I can catch him by yourself. That is cold-blooded. Wow. Hey, I'm just trying to tell you how the pimp talks to your own brain. Wow. And I'm just trying to tell you how to leave that pimp. Be free. <laughs> Be free. What I say, is that kids? I want to say, huh? I'm just trying to save you. Keep reading. This way, we can always be right. Second, if we do put our ideas out there and they are criticized, our ego steps in and protect us. We become invested in defending instead of upgrading our ideas. Preacher, prosecutor, politician. Next slide. I'm moving fast because I want to, I'm like, I'm forcing you guys to, one, you guys need to go back and read this book. But I'm trying to help you dive into the content, the, the, the material a little bit deeper 
but you have to read this material. I'm not here to give you shit that you got to get for yourself. Me and my son were running the stairs the other day, and I'm teaching him how to grow his inner strength. And he got to the end of the stairs, and he, he had to dig deep. And he ended up, when he finished the running, he laid in the dirt on his back to the point when he got home, his mother said, What's, what, happened to you? what happened to you? He's like, I just had to lay down. I couldn't breathe. And I said, you know, you got to the top, right? He said, yeah. I said, did I push you? He said, no. Did I pull you? I said, no. Who got you there? He said, I did. I said, that's how life is. At some point, it's all on you. At some point, it's all on you. You can't rely upon me to pull you to the top. It's not, that's not what this game is about. You're going to have to push yourself to the top. All right. Um, next slide. Now, this one here, Kaja. This is what we talked when we was at the uh, retreat. And you just be like, huh? This is where I was going. Go ahead. Online said this is so uncomfortably true. <laughs> <laughs> um, the third flaw is distance. The further we are from the results of our decisions, the easier it is to keep our current views rather than update them. Okay, say again. Read that. Because, you know, the first sentence sometimes, it's like, you know, if you're a chef and it says you got to have the basic ingredient. Sometimes that first sentence is just, it's one of the core ingredients that you just can't leave at home, right? <laughs> it's like the, it's not negotiable. Let's just read that one more time. The further we are from the results of our decisions, the easier it is to keep our current views rather than update them. Mm. I'm going to hit you in a second. Kaja, just wait. I'm coming for you, Kaja. Just sit there. Just, I'm coming. I'm coming. Keep, keep going. When you put your hand on a hot stove, you quickly learn the natural consequence. You hear what he said? When you put your hand on a hot stove, you quickly learn that shit hot. Keep going. <laughs> you pay the price for your mistakes. Since you are a pain-avoiding creature, you update your view. Quick. Before, before you touch another stove, you check to see if it's hot. Ain't no problems no more, right? Ain't no problems. Keep going. But you don't just learn a micro lesson that applies in one situation. Instead, you draw a general abstraction, one that tells you to check before touching anything that could potentially be hot. Mm. Organizations over a certain size often remove us from the direct consequences of our decisions. Stop. Kaja, let me wrap to you for a second. And I'm not going to Focus on you, but I'm just kind of mind you. You just you know the reference. Me and you know the reference. Like we we go back, but I ain't gonna get to no personal details because I don't want your ego looking at me strange. Um, when you have a job, you make decisions every day. You don't see the results. When you have a job, you make decisions every day. You don't see the end results. You don't look at the data. You do. You see distorted results. This is why when you go from having a job to running a business, you suck. Because you never had to deal directly with the direct results. But you get a false sense of confidence that distorts reality. This is a disconnect. Corporate, corporate jobs and most jobs disconnect you from reality. Even if what you do, you see the customer direct response. You don't see the yearly budget. You don't see what everybody's getting paid. You don't see the numbers being moved. You don't see the moves and shakes and adjustments in the market. You don't see none of that stuff. You don't see the reactions of once the company grows a certain size, what is the impact to other parts of the culture? How does it change the city? All you see is you sit in your desk and you get the job done. So when it comes time to get out here in the real world, it's literally, you've never seen this before. You've never seen this before. And I say sell a product, you're like, but wait a minute, I'm used to sales department doing that. Handle your budget. Yeah, but usually accountant does that. Pay your taxes. Ain't that already built in? Uh, healthcare, healthcare. Uh, I'm going to Highland until I'm sick right now. I'll keep it at 100. You cannot see, and yet you have a false sense of value. You in school. You're getting grades. You're a smart motherfucker. You read books I don't want to read. But you ain't never went into the real world and pulled that trigger. You, if, if, if the wind blow too hard, you're going to miss your target. Because in, in the fake world, you're in a clean room with no air, no wind, no noise, no threat, and you shooting enemies across the room, ain't seeing no blood, and shit just falling over all day long. As soon as I seen you out there and you shoot, shoot the first person and you see that body go pop, 
You shake it now. You can't even you can't even pull the trigger no more. Your training means shit until you come out here. It doesn't mean that you can't adjust. It doesn't mean that you don't have references that can accelerate the process. It's just a lot of you mothers are going around giving advice and they never fought. I see mothers trying to teach these classes. You ain't never fought. You ain't never been in reality. You've been removed from the fucking decision. So you've been touching a stove all this time. It's been hot. And all you get is a manager coming to you every once in a while and be like, oh, could you touch a little less sometimes? And maybe a little bit more this day. And you don't even know the reason why. It ain't. You're just trying to be approved by your manager, so you just try to do it better. And so then one day you get a, a chance, an opportunity to jump into the real world and be the person responsible for touching the stove and get lit the fuck up. Because it, it usually work at the office. This is the separation. Then you have the nerves to go to entrepreneurs and say, you know what I think you should be doing better? See, the feedback we need from you is, what are you, how are you experiencing my business? But when you start giving people strategy decisions and strategy feedback and you can't see the terrain they're operating on, that's your ego talking. You don't know shit. And you got to say this to yourself. Don't bullshit yourself. Because the only thing that's going to hurt is you. It doesn't hurt me. I know I, I, learned, I know I let you go. I don't go, oh, that's deep. Thank you, Kaja. That was hella tight what you just said. That's, that's really, either that's not what me and Kaja talked about. But that's tight, Kaja, that's tight what you just said. And when Kaja walk away, I don't even, I just throw it on the wall. If something comes true, I pull off the wall. Because why? I realize when I need some feedback, I need people who, are like engaged in reality, not live behind these distortion walls that gives you a false sense of value. If you're a director of a company, that means you are good within that company. And maybe a company has similar designs. But if you become a director in reality, you'll find you're a beginner. Matter of fact, you're probably even further behind in a beginner because you have a false sense of value. And you're struggling with, that, struggling with the idea that you have no value in the real world. That's ugly. That's ugly. I promise you, if you ask Marquita, if Cassandra showed up today, and you said, hey, what's it like once you left job to the real world? They'll tell you, oh, my God. It ain't nothing like the shit we was doing over here. Matter of fact, if you was, I promise you, what I, me and Marquita never talked about this. I ain't never even approached us about this. If you ask Marquita which one was easier, she'll tell you whatever the fuck we did for, for us was easy. That shit was a walk in the mother. She was, she was taking a nap. Even if she was working hard, it's considered a nap compared to what she has to deal with today. But here's the thing. At some point, she gets used to that. And now she starts to become stronger and, over, and she starts to develop muscles and starts to, starts to control it. And then as you watch her, as you get your $200,000 a year job, you think you could tell her some of, give her some advice. You're too far removed. What should, what should Obama be doing? You too far removed. What should Libby Schaff be doing? You too far removed. What should the homeless be doing? You too far removed. If you're rich, what should poor people do? You too far removed. If you're poor, what should rich people be doing? You too far removed. Shut the fuck up. Go learn. Be curious. Stop arguing. How are you arguing with Jasani about what poor people should be doing and you both are upper middle class? Both of y'all are just two ignorant people arguing about some shit. Y'all both should be like discovering and curiosity. Like, what did you learn? How did you learn that? What do we know is true? Who did you talk to? How many people did you talk to? I can't be. Pastor Chris is no longer his members. He's not. I don't care what you think he is. He's not. He can't, he can't see them purely because guess what? His economic level, his experiences, him traveling, working with other ministers and bishops around the world and him working on other projects is removing him. So once you get that removal, you got to become humble and become curious and know that that's a thing. And you have to start drawing connections and lines. And you got to realize you got to keep updating those lines. This is why you have to start off with questions before making statements. Start off with questions before making statements. Because even what you may assume can be already changed because this could be a different person, different generation, different age, different everything. You bring a company, leave your stereotypes at home. No value. Let's keep rolling. Y'all feeling, feeling okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, no. I think we should pass the question, like, because... <laughs>
<laughs> I know, family. I know. So this kid. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. It's collection plate preacher. I'm just we, we messing up. Um, I've been not here about your church praying for me. Um, <laughs> Um, when we make decisions that other people carry out, we are one or more levels removed and it may not immediately be able to update our understanding. We come a little off the ground, if you will. The further we are from the feedback of the decisions, the easier it is to convince ourselves that we are right and avoid the challenge, the pain of updating our views. That is so much, that is a core, if you understand that alone, you can redesign your business tomorrow. When you're making decisions for your, your teams that's out in the field, you don't know exactly what they're doing. You have theories. If you're making decisions for your vendors, you're just coming from your own theories. In order for you to make better decisions about what to do, this is, this is about, remember, problem avoidance is you got to learn to broaden your vision of everything around you. Let's take that social justice shot at the room. I, that shit sucks. It, it sucks beyond a matter. It's almost mental health ch challenging. But there is a variable there that's valuable, which is stop trying to stereotype. It works against you as a business person. Because there's so many, even in your own race, in your own house, there's so many variations. you got to accept variations as the name of the game you're playing now. You're not in the game of just going to work and then protecting the small identity that you have because you go to work every day. You're now in the world of engaging others where there's a whole bunch of different ways of thinking. And you don't get to say, I'm not talking to you because you don't say what I, you don't believe what I believe in. I'm not talking to you because I disagree. Now, don't get me wrong. Child molesters got to go. I don't have no, I, I, I'm personally say this. I don't care how y'all feel about child molesters. If y'all, if y'all child molester friendly, I'm sorry. I'm about to hurt your feelings because they suck. Pimps who are, exploiting young women and trap. Okay, these are things that are obvious without, without saying. But there's things that we disagree with. For example, I don't care for earthly people, but I will surprise you how I will work with them in business. And you'll be like, damn, why'd you do that, Nana? I separate the two. I know I personally like earthly people, and when they talk to me too long, my eyes will start rolling. So sometimes I have to like, do little tricks to help me get around it. But today I was walking to, I was in San Francisco on Park Street, and this guy earthly as he wanted to do, and he was just sitting like, I'm in my car. My window happened to be down, which is rare. And he goes, hi. Like, it's like a really thin guy, very feminine. Hi. I say, hey, have a nice day. I was like, yo, that's tight. That's actually dope. If the gay community had representatives who did that for uh, um, every month, once a year, it would change more people than you can imagine towards gay culture. Because he tapped my human side. And when he said, have a nice day, I was like, oh, that felt good. That was nice. It's like a law of reciprocity kicking in. And I almost wanted to go say, hey, man, who are you? What are you doing? It was brilliant, right? And he was, he was the, I, like, I'm a very masculine man. He was extremely feminine. Like, he was extremely, extremely, extremely feminine, right? Even the gay people were like, God, he is pretty feminine. And that didn't even matter. And he neutralized that whole energy by his humanness, by him saying hi. You got to get past yourself to build something greater than yourself. Small thinking, small thinking don't build big things. Small thinking doesn't build big things. So if you want to build big things in this world, you got to get past your small thinking. Straight up. Write your question down, lady, because I'm 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 when we get through with the uh, the flaws, the, this this opening section, I'm gonna come right back to you. So, the distance you gotta realize that you're always being removed. If you decide to move your product from Oakland to Sacramento, that's a distance. If you move your product from old to young, that's a distance. If you move your product from from uh, 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 different gender preferences, that's a distance. I give a fuck if you have a friend that's gay. I give a fuck if you have a friend that's black. I give a fuck if you have a friend that's Latino. I give a fuck if you have a friend that's Asian. I give a fuck if you have a friend that's white. It's a distance. Once you see that, you know what tools to seek out. But if you start assuming you can see everybody because you share common words with each other, you don't see anybody. You just see yourself. All you're doing is projecting. You got to learn to see value in things around you. We're so busy playing defensive that we've learned to negatively remove so many things from our life that we, we threw out the baby in the bathwater. We have to learn to bring 
the baby back into our life, which is the value of human lives. If you want to build something in this world, you got to value the world you're about to build in. You don't get to shit on this world, devalue it, and then be successful in this world. Just it doesn't work that way. You might make money for a minute, but you'll be destroyed. You'll be destroyed. It'll catch you. All right, I'm gonna take a couple questions. I'm gonna set up my timer. Five minutes, then, we, then I'm gonna go into the next section. Questions? Go ahead, Shakina. We're gonna make it just how you lose that weight today. Watch this. <laughs> just how you ain't really got no weight. I'm just messing with him. Go ahead. Um, this was a question from the beginning of. Huh? He just wants to move from right to left of the room. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, 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 okay. Next time, just, hey, just deal with it, and let's fix it next class, okay? No more disruptions like that. Go ahead. Um, this was just a question from the beginning of class. Um, I wrote down, um, can benchmarks become a distraction, and how do you identify when you need to pivot as your business go, grows through different stages? We're going to get there. I'm going to talk about teaching about pivot and when to pivot. Um, that's going to be a whole, it's a lot that goes in pivot. Pivoting is not a simple answer. Next one. P pivoting is going to come up because that's another thing too is a lot of people hold on to bad ideas too long and then they just beat themselves up when it's just a bad idea. And so you got to know when to pivot. Go ahead. How do we ask, or I'll speak for myself, how do I ask for feedback as a new small business without looking like I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not ready to take Ego just kicked in. You said, so you, you that question had ego built into it. Okay. So the first part was humble, which is how do I ask as a small business, right? But no, how do I ask for feedback? Everything from that point on was your ego. As a small business, don't matter what size business you are, right? If you move in that direction, I don't give a fuck. If, when you're at the top, you're going to ask simple questions. When you're at the bottom, you're going to ask simple questions. And when you're at the bottom, you're going to ask hard questions. And when you're at the top, you're going to ask hard questions. So where you are is that's, that's your ego starting to kick in by recognizing where you are. Then you said without, without, seem like I don't know anything. Guess what? The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know anything. I don't know anything. Nobody in this room knows enough to be bold enough to walk around like we know anything. Acting, walking around trying to hold on to the status of knowledge is the coldest game the pimp has ever sold you. Once again, that pimp is so, look here. I'm telling you, he wears furs, baby. And what he said to your ear is that if you're not smart, you're gonna be the bottom. I mean, if you're smart, you'll be the bottom. If you're not, you know what I'm talking about, right? You can't listen to that part of your brain. That brain is your so cold because knowledge is so vast that we can't, live, we can't live long enough to even be valuable enough to make an argument. I'm going to get into circle genius later on on how to find value in your knowledge. But this whole idea of claiming all-knowing is a lie. There's no such thing. So you are always be ignorant. And matter of fact, the questions you've asked this class that may be considered ignorant by other people have been amazing questions. Amazing questions. Don't you ever lose that for nobody. And fuck your image. Fuck your image. Let the world call you who it's going to be. Don't you sit up here and try to define yourself. Fuck your image. Trust me, when the world starts celebrating you, it's going to scare you anyway. When you, when, you become, when you finally get to the point where people start, there was one year, me, so me and Mashama, we put our heads down. We was working. We working. We meeting our customers. We working. This was just me and Mashama at the time. We started making traction. We built a brand that we're not even aware of to the outside world. For two or three months, me and, me and Mashama would go to different places. I went to concerts, clubs. They knew who I was. They would make an announcement when I walked to the room. None of us has just entered the house. What? Who? Wait a minute. I ain't been out in four years. How the fuck? I don't even know who you are announcing me. In Vogue was singing and put a shout out to me. I ain't never been in Vogue. I, pro I promise you, I don't even know. The, I don't know their names to this day. I just like the way they sing. I'm at the concert in the red. The DJs from the, at KBLX acknowledge me. The, okay, the lead guy knows me, who's like puts the events on. And then Vogue came out, acknowledged me, and they came over and started singing to me. I said, "Holy!" People think that I'm Michael Jackson out here. <laughs> you don't define that path. If you do, all you do is leaking resources and leaking time and attention. When you just put the work in, the world will celebrate you like you've never been before to a point it will make you cry. Get your ego out this conversation. Kaja? 
when we talked earlier on the slides about avoiding problems or working to avoid problems, first of all, let me say I'm enjoying today, but I'm not enjoying today because I feel convicted. <laughs> but when we talked about avoiding problems, I found that that landed me straight into cognitive distortion. Because as I move in my first business endeavor, I felt like I'm trying to structure this to avoid problems. I'm coming with correct timing. I'm trying to have check-ins so that we don't end up chasing our tails at the end, even though that's what happened. And I got pissed off and ended up in a bunch of shoulds. We shouldn't be here. This shouldn't be like this because we did this. I took these pains in advance. I tried to time this properly. So how are you balancing the avoiding part with having that land you in a cognitive distortion? Stay right there because that's part two of our lesson. We're going right there. Okay. We're going right there. Great, great question. Great assessment. Great awareness. Great everything in that. Just, just, just great, 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 great. 12, 12 greats. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, let's keep rolling. We're going, I'm going to keep stopping and giving space for questions and dialogue. But I want you guys to know that I got to move you guys. And I don't want to stay anywhere too long. And next class, if there's something that's just really brew, that, that, that was brewing inside of you that you want to bring up as a question, let's start, this, let's start the class off with those questions. But I'm, I will also give time for questions. And I will give us time to go back and revisit the psychology of money. Next, next slide, please. So this is okay. Before we get started, this is one of my favorite mental models. We're gonna ride through this, and I'm gonna drop so many bums on you. So take a deep breath, clear out distractions, because it's about to get heated. All right, y'all ready? All right, let's go. Techniques for establishing first principles. If we never learn to take something apart, test our assumptions about it, and reconstruct it, we end up bound by what other people tell us. Okay, so real quick. That line is, that paragraph is so damn powerful. I don't think you understand. Okay, let me say this real quick. So first principle thinking is you take an idea, and Court talked this a little bit, but I'm going to go over this real quick and we're going to come back to it. And this is going to talk about what you said, Kaja. Let's say I want to do A or I want to do B. And this is how it's done. Within that, what, you have, what you'll find is that there's a lot of times in your thinking, you've automatically entered a lot of false assumptions. A lot of false assumptions that you don't know exist. So you take those false assumptions and you act on those false assumptions, even though it's based upon a core good idea or a good model. But often, if you don't, if you're not able to remove the assumptions and challenge each assumption, then what ends up happening is you just end up copying and pasting what others have done, not realizing there's no innovation. First principle thinking is how you gain access to creative thinking and innovation. Everybody in this room is creative, but you don't know it because you don't, your brain copies and pastes idea, good ideas as opposed to going, how do I know this is true? So... Read that first paragraph again so I can put some context around that. Go ahead. Read the first paragraph again. If we never learn to take something apart, test our assumptions about it, and reconstruct it, we end up bound by what other people tell us. So, you know all the black folks who told you that racism is real, all the stories you've seen about civil rights, and some of y'all have never changed because y'all think this is your destiny? Do you realize that when Martin Luther King was battling racism in the South, he was dealing with crowds of 400. He went to Chicago and said, I've never seen 10,000 before. I don't know how to respond to this. I don't know if I have a system for this, solution for this. In Oakland today, where racism has changed, redesigned itself, and systemic racism is a legacy that haunts us, we're still talking about 1960s methods because all we're doing is taking principles from the past and we're not rethinking any of those principles, meaning that we're doomed to have the same future. And a lot of these people, going back to that investment story you heard earlier, his sister said, it worked for me. So you're taking the, the voices and knowledge of the ones you trust and love to doom yourself. 
And you're overriding your own ability to think through your own future because you're trapped in the love of the relationships you have with people around you and your community. Some of you are so, I'm pro-black culture. I love black people. If black people give me gay, I don't want to hear what white people got to say. But I got to read black books only. I don't read white books. I got to hear what black, Asians, I don't know about them Asian folks. They don't really be right with some of y'all don't realize that that shit is so outdated knowledge and you never question it. And some of y'all even get offended when I tell you it's bullshit in this class. That's been class where I told y'all that shit sucks. And y'all be like, oh, oh man, how you gonna tell me? He, he, he's the one, because he, he got money, he's one of them Negroes now. You didn't understand the process, you made a judgment because all you did is you became a prosecutor. You started to prosecute me because I didn't agree with you. But what I was using was first principle thinking, which is I took every assumption. I was automatically, all my assumptions going, huh, is that true? And I started to challenge my basic assumptions. And guess what I found out? It didn't hold up. It didn't hold up. And then I had to refill it up again and redesign it again. And guess what I found myself doing? Moving myself further and further from popular opinion. This is the gateway from disconnecting from popular opinion. Key reading. Trapped in the way things have always been done. When the environment changes, we just continue as if things were the same, making costly mistakes along the way. So, okay. God, this is so much. This is so business. I don't think you guys understand how much business. When we get to some of this business stuff, real rigid business stuff, these are the foundation principles. You're going to hear so much. It's going to blow your mind. That. Do you realize a lot of these gurus who teach you, they learn these principles and then they sound like gods to you because you don't understand where it's coming from? They're not godly. They just own these basic principles and they just, they just let these principles load up these principles. Read that line again. It's so amazing. Trapped in the way things have always been done. When the environment changes, we just continue as if things were the same, making costly mistakes along the way. So... Everything around racism has changed. Everything around your business idea that you just started yesterday has changed. Everything around your relationship has changed. Everything about your child has changed. Everything about you has changed. And yet you try to do everything the same. This is why you're shrinking the knowledge you have. There is no same. There is no same. There is no same. This, like he said, the book, he said, we say history repeats itself. No, man repeats itself. There is no same. So you are holding on to all these old ideas. We got to march. We got to protest. I want to run these kind of businesses. When I start my business, I'm going to do it like this. Where'd you get that from? How you know that's true? I said my accounting system like this. How, where you get that from? How you know that's true? I'm going to hire these kind of employees and I'm, gonna, and, and I'm going to orientate them this way. Where would you get that from? How do you know that's true? When I sell my items on the market, I'm going to wrap them like this. Where would you get that from? How do you know that's true? It was true when you did it today, when it first started. But now that all the competition does that, is it still true? Now it's a new generation buying your product. Is it still true? Now your product just made it to New York and they don't care for what you just said. Is it still true? I, th I think you understand the first principle of thinking is so damn powerful. It's trying to, I'm trying to get you outside of yourself. See, when you think about yourself, nothing, you don't want anything to change because your body loves certainty. So change is a statement of uncertainty. Your brain burns more calorie. Your brain panics. Your brain does not want uncertainty. But if you decide you want to move in a world of 8 billion people, you got to get used to uncertainty as a base feeling, a base way of moving. First principle thinking is, a, is like a map or it's a tool to actually help you access ways of thinking that you were not born with or you haven't been privileged with. Keep going. Some of us are naturally skeptical of what we're told. Maybe it doesn't match up to our experiences. Maybe it's something that used to be true but isn't true anymore. And maybe we just think very differently about something. When it comes down to it, everything that is not a law of nature is just a shared belief. Let me say this again. Go slow down, slow down. What, what's that last statement you said? Everything is not a what? Everything that is not a law of nature is just a shared belief. You know, Shakina fought in Vietnam, so she can't hear a lot. Anyway, here's the thing. <laughs> 
everything that's not nature itself, for the religious people, everything that's not godly itself is just a shared belief. A city is a shared belief. Everything you do in a city is a shared belief. Every title, position you shake, you, you, you inherit is a shared belief. Your relationships, you as a human being, is nature. There are certain things you have that's part of your nature as an animal, because you are an animal, that you don't get to change. You don't get to have immaculate conception and produce children. Nature has rules for us that we just don't get to break. But everything else is a shared belief. That means as beliefs change, so does the world around us aggressively. So when you get this, this is the way it is. Yeah, for you, and that's why you where you are. It's literally, you are your own prison. You, you, you are your own warden. And in order for you to free yourself, you got to get outside. You got to break away from that pimp that's been holding you all this time. We got to come up with a name for that pimp. Next slide. So here are some of the things you want to do to start to embrace first principle thinking. Go ahead. Principle thinking, clarifying your thinking and explaining the origin of your ideas. Why do I think this? What exactly do I think? Challenging assumption. Oh my God, this is going to be so much power. Go ahead. How do I know this is true? What if I thought the opposite? But go ahead. Looking for evidence. How can I back this up? What are the sources? Considering alternative perspectives. What my other things? How do I know I am correct? Mm -hmm. Examining consequences and implications. What if I am wrong? What are the consequences if I am? Mm. Questioning the original question. Mm. Why did I think that? Was I correct? What conclusions can I draw from the reasoning process? This is a bustle you built. This muscle right here is a superpower. Watch this. Kaja, tell me about, you said your business went bad because you were trying to protect it. What did you do to protect it? Well, it, it wow. It, it didn't go bad, but it didn't run as efficiently as I would like. I, I, what did I, you do? I believed to I got the proper head start on timing. I believed I communicated clearly and got an agreement, a shared agreement on. To stop. So timing. You say, okay, this is just communication. Yes. Why do you believe you had a great communication? Because I had the conversation and walked away with a mutual agreement. How do you know that they, they, they were able to translate what you were telling them and it was relevant to them? I don't know. Have you ever taken a course that trained you on how to manage large groups of people? I have. And in that process, what tools do you think that you use that were absolutely successful? Verbal communication followed up by a written reiteration so that there's not confusion. So what was the incentives that you gave them to also follow those rules? I thought it was going to be money. No, no. So you don't, you don't understand incentives at all. So you assume you understood incentives. Okay. Right? Um, can you start to hear the assumptions she's having? All I'm looking for is, all I'm listening for is assumptions. If you go into a business meeting and just listen for assumptions, you can change everybody's world. That's a superpower. If somebody comes to you about their personal life, when she said, I had a team, and da, 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 she blasted me with confidence in her ego. I taught my team this, and they followed me, and we didn't make it to the promised land. They weren't ready. What? Wait, what? How do you know that's a promised land? Was it promised land for everybody? How you know it's for everybody? Where is your proof that everybody wants to go there? What systems did you use? Are you familiar with all the different systems? Do you understand all the tools of changing human behavior? How do you know how you showed up in that space? So even though, going back to disqualifying 
and negative filtering, right? She can't see what she did wrong because she's focusing on who? Them. She could do the same thing again, and it works. We talked about that earlier, right? Oh, no, excuse me, on, um, not, uh, overgeneralization. There's nothing about overgeneralization in everything she's saying. But, it's, but as a human being, do you feel the energy that you feel when she speaks? This is when I tell you guys to turn the stories down and learn to think through optionality. Because stories have so much energy that they blind you to the point that the guy who made the investment heard a story that he couldn't even think about what he knew. If she, if, if Kaja, who's an alpha female, when she speaks, she speaks, she roars. I mean, she can move through your body. If she was coming at me strong, even if she wrong, I, I would feel some kind of way. But like, okay, <laughs> I felt that, right? Because she has that kind of power about her. So when she explains herself in her humility, humility, and she says, this is what I'm going through, it's full of assumptions, if I was working with her as a consultant, I would slow everything she just said down and said, okay, let's go over each stage. You want them to follow what? Why? Well, how much was you paying them? How much did they get paid before? What was the competition paying them? What is the competition job like? What's your job like? What are the other benefits? What's your incentive plan? Incentive plan has nothing to do with money most of the time. As a matter of fact, money is the lowest level of incentives. What's your incentive plan? How do you design that? What's your mantra? What's your story? Where are you going? How long have you been in business? How, what was your success rate? How did you show up as a leader? I would start tearing all those things down. Guess what? She would realize, I didn't know what I was doing. But she has no reason to know that because first principle of thinking, none of us do that. We don't do that. We take these assumptions, which she did. That's why I want to say I wanted to wait. She was making so many assumptions, and she just assumed that all these ideas were strong because the core things she was saying was strong. I gave them clear deliverables. I asked them to do something. They didn't perform. There's no lies there. There's no distortions there. The distortion is in the how, the what, the why. So if court calls me, we're talking business, I don't get caught up in, you know, nothing. I just sold four million. Cool. I'm having a problem. Huh. What happened? Huh. What I did, da, 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 da. At this point, I'm turning that volume down. Okay, he's going to give him some time to talk about himself. Okay, now let's get into the details. Literally, that's what I'm going to do in my brain. Because I realized that's everybody's, everybody's a preacher now. She was preaching to me. Did she not preach earlier? I did this. I did that. I did this. Then she went a little prosecutor. Then I told him to do this, and then I gave him these details. She's not different. You all do it. I'm taking you guys to a new dimension. Nobody in this class is going to be flawed in this next six months. There's nothing you're going to say. I'm going to say, hmm, Kaja. Kaja, based upon her local surroundings, is normal. But Kaja decides she wants to build something which says she don't want to be normal no more. So she can't do normal shit and do extraordinary. She can't be a normal person doing extraordinary shit. She has to take a path towards extraordinary. You guys see the difference? So if she just wants to stay normal and Kaja has a great life. I mean, every time I talk to her and see her, it's almost like you want to do what she's doing. She can just stay there. But Kaja said, I want to do more. That means she can't stay the same. She can't. She's going to raise bars, change perspective, change directions, erase ideas, enter new ideas. So all of you would have did the exact same thing, but I bet you somebody in this room is like, hmm, she sure did. <laughs> no one asks what the fuck you do. Most of the time when people come to me and gossip about somebody else, they're really talking about themselves. You know that? And I just sit there and listen all the time going, oh, yeah, really? What? They did what? Oh, yeah, they ain't shit. Now, it's different when you point out somebody, something somebody else did and you use it to examine, like, huh, this is something that was interesting to me and something I need to learn from that. Or I wonder why they did that. Like if you bring out something about somebody did, but it's based upon curiosity, that's different. I'm talking about when you talk about somebody to put yourself, to change your status to that person. So the person who's a fool in class that's keeping your ego quiet, no, you are not changing your life because fools surround you. Let's keep going, y'all. I'm just warming up. We're still going for a special thinking. Let's keep it going. And by the way, Class is going to be moving like this for six months. We're not slowing down for six months. 
I don't even have enough time to teach all the shit I want to teach. There's more than uh, the amount of principles I'm going to teach. I'm just going to teach the core, the strongest ones that's relative to the things I've seen in this class and the things I see to relative to the business and where you guys are at level. If we have different businesses of different sizes, there's a lot more principles to learn. Here we go ahead. Socratic questioning stops you from relying on your gut and limit. Oh, 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 oh. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You even get, you even get away with that one too easy. So say that one again. <laughs> Socratic, <laughs> Socratic questioning <laughs> stops you from relying on your gut and limits strong emotional responses. Some of y'all, now, gut has a place, one-on-one. -on -one. It's cool, it's not scalable. Gut has no room in the world of scaling businesses. Gut is the biggest fucking liar you've ever heard. He hangs out with Pimpy Doo, they be in your brain. Gut is a con man. Because gut will tell you that you are, gut is an agent of your ego. Let me say this again. Your gut is an agent of your ego. You read a small sample size to your gut. You can't read a large sample size to your gut. You cannot do it. So this is why I shit on gut talking. It's not that I don't absolutely agree with some places where gut plays a role. But if y'all know, it's like, I'll be like, I don't want to hear that gut shit. Whatever, gut, whatever. I roll my eyes. Because when you decide you want to scale a business, your gut can't give you the information you need. You're going to have to get away from your feelings and your emotions and your gut. All that shit right there is keeping you small. Small in your personal life, small in your relationships, small in your friendships. Some of y'all are lonely as hell because your goddamn gut. See, it's different if gut it was a pure line. Even if it was a pure line, it's a limitation on it because still it's an agent of ego. But in addition of it, not 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 having the ability to measure large sample sizes, a lot of your guts are distorted by the way you think. So you can't rely upon your gut. Let's keep it rolling. This process helps you build something that lasts. So that's, that's it. Y'all don't know about scaling yet. Because you guys can't hear scaling. I can. I've been studying this shit for three years. It's just crazy. He just spoke to scalers but did speak to you. Some of you guys thought the process at last, and y'all, your brain went to happily ever after. Hmm. But people who have investment in building long-term solutions see the science in what just was just said. Pull your gut out of any the long. When you play the long game, pull your gut out the game. When you play the long game, you gotta pull those strong emotions out the game. It doesn't mean you're going to always be emotional. We're talking about the strong emotion responses. Gut has no place. And I'm going, to, I'm going to make a scientific argument. I'm going to get into details of scaling, and you're going to see where gut's going to fail, especially when we get into data. Studying data, you're going to realize gut going to be wrong so much, it's going to make your head spin. And even in factfulness, he's going to show you where your gut was absolutely wrong. He has a test. As soon as you read the book Factfulness, there's a test at the beginning of the book that shows you your gut has no place. Go ahead. The goal of the, the goal of the five whys. So that's the five whys we just read. Is to land on a what or how. It is not about introspection, such as why do I feel like this? Pause. So, this is something me and Court talked about, and Court is like, yeah, let's do it. Is me and you guys got caught up in that space right there. How do I feel? No, no, I don't know. After class, I feel more like, no, no, you know, I feel my emotions. I don't know, no, no. I, I've been, I'm in an emotional feeling loop lately, and I've just been looping around feeling and feeling. And what do you want to say about my feelings, Nana? No, no. This is not what I'm teaching you. This is not about introspection here. What you about to learn in the next six months? In the old words of old Nana, fuck your feelings. I'm not teaching you about your feelings today. I'm teaching you how to build something. I'm talking about, I'm talking about if you want to build your PTA team. If you want to build your church uh, um, uh, reading team, if you want to build anything from this point on, we're going, to teach, we're going to talk about the principles of building. These are the invisible systems that are controlling the world around you that you feel victimized by that you just give the title racism or the power or the rich or use all these little popular go-to terms, and it can't be further from the truth. It's really you are titling your own ignorance. Let's roll. Rather, it is about systematically delving further into a statement or concept so that you can separate reliable knowledge from assumption. Mm -hmm. If your whys result in a statement of falsifiable fact, 
Mm-hmm. You have had a first principle. Let me say it again. Say it again. If your whys result in a statement of falsifi- falsifiable facts, mm-hmm. you have, may have hit a first principle. Keep going. If they end up with a because I said so or it just is. Okay. How many of y'all heard the black community when it says that because I said so or it just is? How many of you guys have done that to your children? Because I said so. It just is. I mean, you've just been assuming your parenting. You ain't never asked. This is, okay, you guys want to do this bare parenting? It's like going to do bunk-ass parenting classes where y'all sit around and do these emotional-ass loops about your feelings and practice first principles with your children, and you automatically upgrade your parenting. Because then you start asking yourself questions like, well, why did I say it this way? What other options are there? Keep going. If is. they end up with a because I said so or it just is, you know you have landed on an assumption that may be based on popular opinion. Based on what? Popular opinion. I think, I think so what? Popular opinion. Have I been telling you guys, did you guys think through popular opinion you don't even know it? If you, look at the, if you think about most of the ideas you think about life, you didn't even investigate them. You just copied and pasted the most popular opinion, and now you walk around being bad, but we're going to whoop somebody's butt because they challenged the most popular opinion that you never owned, but now you're giving yourself ownership. They, you didn't own that knowledge. That knowledge owns you. Keep going. Cultural myth or dogma? A culture myth. You know white people. You know Asian people. You know gay people. You know short people. You know tall people. You know smart people. You know dumb people. You know, doctors, you know, lawyers, you know, police officers. You see where I'm going with this? A lot of this shit is just culture myths in the making. A lot of these popular movements are producing modern day cultural myths, and you can't even call it. You can't even think for yourself no more. You Now you're mad at police and shit, and the cop has been helping you all this time, and all of a sudden, because you don't saw stuff on TV and you watch the news and you join the movement, now you're looking at them like, I wish you would. Myths. I'm not saying everybody's great. I'm not saying everybody's bad. I'm saying you're not thinking. That's the challenge of the day. You're not thinking, and you're not rethinking. You think by adding thoughts, it's going to fix you. That's why when you add a thought without rethinking, you find yourself in internal conflict. Oh, I know you're right, but it's, I don't know you. I know you're telling the truth, Nana, but oh, this is how I feel. Because you never learn how to rethink. Change is a process of thinking and rethinking. Keep going. These are not first principles. Keep rolling. Let's go to the next slide. I'm not slowing down. Y'all thought I'm joking. I ain't playing. (laughs) Go ahead. There is no doubt that both of these methods slow us down in the short term. We have to pause, think, and research. So go back to what I said, distractions. Here is the movement of poor, poverty, weak, and impotent people. You're too busy to slow down and think. It's a common thing I hear all the time from people who are suffering. No, no, I want to do this, but I'm just too busy. I, I try to read, but I ain't got no time. My kids. You have to take time to improve your strategies. Otherwise, you are overworking the dumb shit. You are a master dumb shit employee. And all you produce is dumb shit. And guess how much money you have in the bank? It's some dumb shit. To change your life, you got the first, the first rule is create time to change your life. As long as you're busy and you're not taking time to rethink and think, you're just repeating the same habits. And then in hindsight, you try to be hella deep about it. Yeah, you know, what I, you know at the time, I was, I was in some mental distortion. I, and I realized, you know, if I would just follow these principles that you taught in class, I would have changed this stuff. I told my friend that's what she needed to do. No. You need to create time to tell yourself what to do. Because right now, you're on autopilot following the rules of dumb shit. Then you're going to get mad when well, you try hide, start hiding from me because he might see my dumb shit. But if I say, hey, you know, Shabisha's got some dumb shit. Hey, hold on. First of all, I am a woman. Me too. You are disrespecting me. Obviously, you have no respect. I don't know who raised you, where you come from. Now you're a prosecutor. But you're suffering from what? Some dumb shit. 
And why are you suffering from dumb shit? It's not because you are dumb. See, now you're disqualifying the positive and you're negative thinking. You're not dumb. you just never giving yourself time to be smart. Time, attention, money. I've been giving you a basic ass formula of change, time, attention, protect those three, invest in those three and become aware of those three and watch you start, start changing your own life. But when time gets away from you and your attention gets away from you, then your money gets away from you too, baby. It's a cold game. I saw Adidas collaborated with Gucci and they're selling a jacket for 3000 and some odd dollars for a jacket. I, 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 I started to look on Wikipedia. Is Jesus' family still around? Because I want to believe that that's the only person that could have made that, that jacket to spend $3,000. <laughs> Wikipedia said, I don't know what you're talking about. You should cut this out, right? And what I discovered is that, oh, people wasn't buying expensive material. They were buying status because they didn't feel like they were good enough. You leaking because you don't love yourself. See, when you don't handle certain things, you start to leak. My son told me the other day he would buy some $800 shoes if he had the money. I said, I'm not going to even talk to you about that because I realized you were struggling with love of self. And until we fix that, this is a wasted conversation. You leaking. Time, attention, money is another form of a leak. If you don't manage your time, you don't manage your attention, you're going to leak so much money. If you understand the rules of time, did you know at 21, when you went to college, you said, I want to be this. But you know, by the based on the rules of time, by the time you're 25, you probably don't want to be that anymore. But now you devastated because you realize I don't want to be that anymore. But you've already taken a job and now you feel like you suffered in a job. You wish you wasn't there anymore because you didn't know that time will change all things. You don't know no principles of time. You're just following time blindly, and you think you run in this game. You don't run this game. you just another actor in a movie that's already been written. Yes, every once in a while, you may have an opportunity to be a star, a supporting star, but the movie wasn't written for you. You are an actor of a beautiful movie that was already written. So once you understand the rules of time, attention, money, it's going to come up a lot. You're going to realize, oh, shit. Every time you say, well, I don't have time to read that book. I don't have time to listen to that material. Some books ain't about reading it once. I don't know who told us that goddamn lie. Oh, that's, that's that bad poverty educational system. Some books get that read time. I will read some pages 10 times. I'm not exaggerating this. For my audio book, sometimes I will play it back to back the whole day and then go home and reread it again and then research the terms and the, the principles around it to really own that principle. See, it's called, it's called learning is an act of, rep, of, of repetition. But some of y'all don't have time for repetition. If you don't get it right away, I got to go. Well, once again, you don't have time to be intelligent. You got you, you stuck on that ignorant shit. Go ahead. They seem to get in the way of what we want to accomplish. And after we do them a couple of times, we realize that after one or two questions, we are often lost. We actually don't know how to answer most of the questions. But when we are confronted with our own ignorance, we can't just give up or result to self-defense. So he says, so when you ask yourself, you're going back through your assumptions. Yeah. And you start to question assumptions and you realize, I don't know the answer to these questions. Yeah. Some of us either quit or go in defense mode. Well, you know, everybody don't know the question, but it still gets done. Well, what about when she did it? It worked for her. Well, look, they shouldn't, they, I, it, it must be work for somebody. Why would, be, why would everybody be doing it? You get where I'm going with this? You, so you revert back to defense or I ain't got time to think about that shit. I'm just going to do what I did yesterday. I want y'all to see this game. Keep going. If we do, we will never identify the first principles we have to work with. 
and will instead make mistakes that will slow us down in the long term. So when you're making, it's the, it's the rule of hustling. Making fast decisions, making, fa- making fast decisions and poor decisions may get you a short-term reward, but you're not playing the long game. You can, all of us can be rich for a blink of an eye and live the rest of our life poor. I'm not exaggerating this point. If you're playing the long game, that means you're trying to protect your relationship with life itself. You're going to have to convert from this fast moving, quick pace, I'm too busy, to questioning, rethinking, and learning how to think. I just keep, no, keep, just come on, come on. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still warming up. Come on, keep, keep it going. I'm still warming up. Next one. <laughs> Next slide. Many people mistakenly believe that creativity is something that only some of us are born with. And either we have it or we don't. Fortunately, there seems to be ample evidence that this isn't true. So y'all done heard that a thousand times. I'm not creative. You're creative, but I'm not creative like you. That's a popular idea. That's just not true. But that's just everywhere. I hear so much all the time. I'm like, do you know how I became a commercial photographer? Because I told myself, I'm not going to accept that I can't do it. Because I ain't never did anything creative where I'm like, oh, I love the way I draw. Man, I'm the coldest stick figure drawer, circle, line, 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 line. Kill it every time. And, and I even put my own little personality on them. I put a little color on them every once in a while. That's all I've ever drawn. But I can shoot the fuck out of the camera. And guess what I did? Repetition. Repetition and change the way I thought. And I started to challenge the basic basic foundation of my thinking. Well, why can't you shoot? What, what, I started to break down what makes a photographer great, and I broke it down into small little chunks and said, can I build that myself? And guess what I did? I built it. Was out shooting people with my eyes closed. But I broke myself down and pushed myself past my own limitations. Keep going. We're all born rather creative, but during our formative years, it can be beaten out of us by busy parents and teachers. Uh Uh-oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Black black folks, Latino folks, my Asian folks, my white folks. Let's run that back one more time. We're all born rather creative, but during our formative years, it can be beaten out of us by busy parents and teachers. Busy parents and teachers. So not only are you not busy enough to beat out yourself, you're abusing Others? Keep going. As adults, we rely on convention and what we're told because that's easier than breaking things down into first principles and thinking for yourself. Thinking through first principles is a way of taking off the blinders. Most things suddenly seem more possible. Did you see, read that last plane? The last line is everything. Those at home, hear this because I don't want y'all. I don't want y'all to miss that last thing. Most things suddenly seem more possible. Most things suddenly seem more possible. The limits of your thinking is because you have too many assumptions you have never challenged, which creates limits of what's out there and what's possible when you get in the real world. You are victimized because your assumptions have limited you to the way the world really works. When you start to break your assumptions, you start to create more options and possibilities and even potentials. Elon Musk, that is his secret. This is how he's killing the world right now. He's a master of first principle thinking. He takes something that everybody assumes that everybody says is true, and he goes, well, how do we know it's true? Could could we possibly change that? That's been his whole mode of operation since he's been in existence. Many of you don't know what business to start tomorrow because you're clogged with bad assumptions. Many of you guys are stuck in impression, bad relationships because you're clogged with bad assumptions. Many of you have a fucked up life because you're clogged with bad assumptions. And you don't know that you can go, you can go back and challenge all of your assumptions. Many of you are traumatized by your assumptions. Many of you are scared of your assumptions. Many of you are immobilized because of your assumptions. Some of y'all don't even leave the house because of your assumptions. Some of y'all don't even talk to other races, other people because of your assumptions. Some of y'all don't talk to poor people, rich people, young people, old people because of your assumptions. I watched y'all talk about Donald Trump through assumptions. None of us know Donald Trump. No one knows his, knew his motivations. 
He could have been 100% right while he was in office. He could have been 100% wrong while he was in office. But all we did was share the assumptions and then doing, once we shared those assumptions, peep this. We, we grew our personal fears and discomforts. Some of us were sick to the stomach by Donald Trump and didn't know shit about him. And some of us fell in love with him and didn't know shit about him because all we did was projecting our own assumptions. The assumption game is so thick that if you leave here tonight and you stay with assumptions alone and start planning and juggling that ideas and listen to people's assumptions and asking questions like, well, why, how do you know that? And, and you realize all of us are just copy and pasting these horrible ideas that are full of assumptions and nobody's rethinking. This is what popular thinking is at its very core is we're spreading assumptions. Some work. And now you might say, now that should I always think like this? No. But if something matters, you should. I mean, okay, if I'm playing basketball with Court, he's way better basketball player. Um, and he says, no, this is how we play. I say, okay, cool. I don't need to ask him, well, how do you know that? Where they come from? I'm not going to do that. Play basketball. We're playing dominoes and I'm whooping them. He's, and I say, game's over. He's going to say, no, no, where do you get that from? We're going to set the assumption that we all agree. He knows how I put myself in a domino game. I just want to let y'all know that. He beat me in basketball. I beat him in dominoes. Now we even. Anyway, put this. Eagle, the eagle got back in that conversation. Court, I mean, um, there's somebody in the back of the room that's been traumatized. I'm, I'm just be, let's bring it down. Don't say Lakers. Don't say Dominoes. We'll be all right. Okay, so anyway, point is this. Um, because that's just too many losses in one conversation. You know what I'm saying? That's just too many losses. Like, that's, like you live in, that's like you live in a world where everybody's going when you wake up, right? It's just too much. Anyway, point is this. So... <laughs> like you like you know like the walking dead, right? Everybody just everybody's zombies now. <laughs> so anyway, the point is this. But we don't realize how much when you're making de decisions about your business and you're trying to make decisions for other people's lives and the direction of your company, and you sit down in a meeting with your team, you don't sit down to find agreements. You don't sit down to argue your point. You don't sit down to look for a magic key. The first thing I would challenge people to do is, what are the core problems that are facing us? What do we think the solution is? And where, are, where do our assumptions lie? And what do we not know to be true? And where do we start our research to make, develop a robust, a robust decision-making machine to solve our own problems? That's a formula right there. You can go to a mini business meetings right now, play the assumption game, and they think you're a guru. You don't, now here's the cold part. Keep going. Let's keep going. It's going to get better. Keep going. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before we, go, go, before we get to the next, because the next one's an example. The more you learn, the more your assumption game gets better. The more you learn, the more your assumption game gets better. Because let's say somebody's talking to you. You can't hear assumptions if you don't know much. A pop culture brain can't hear much. Because you just, you know how pop culture is like, she's fabulous, do what you want, be happy. Oh my God, I love what she just said. Right? You, that's a pop culture movement. That's an ignorance. This is why I tell people I don't do the pop culture shit. I want to hear you. I'm not going to celebrate you because you're just fabulous. And I just wanna, what I'm trying to do is make myself feel better by saying you're better. Silly. I want to see you. So when you tell me your idea and you're working on, or whatever, somebody's talking to me about business in this room. As you share your idea of what you're working on, I'm listening for what assumptions you have. So before we even get into are, is your formula the right formula or the right methodology, do you have the right methodology but it's full of bad assumptions? And a lot of times I'm going to try to help you find the answer because let me explain something to you as a consultant. Consultant is not the all-knowing. The consultant is like a coach that helps you play a better game. you the one that knows how to dribble that basketball. Jordan knew how to shoot. Jordan knew how to play basketball. Jordan knew a crossover. Jordan knew how to dunk. If Phil Jackson at any point would have grabbed his, would have threw off his suit and had a, some shorts on and told George, you ain't doing it right. Let me get this game and show you what to do. He's no longer a fucking coach. So a consultant, you don't know where people need to go. You got to realize the person has been driving that car understands the terrain they're on. They just has a, they have a distortion or a lack of awareness of something that you're trying to help them gain. You're trying to increase their awareness. You're trying to put a mirror in front of their face. You're trying to use all these tools to help them to discover the right answer, not you give them the right answer. Otherwise, once you focus that you walk into a room to give people the right answer, you are relying upon your ego. This is why when you ask me for advice in this class, 
class in your business? No, my job is just to rattle your cage for you to rethink it and then find the right answer for you. I am not your guru. I told you that shit for five or six years, and some of y'all still be acting like I'm a goddamn guru. I'm your brother and brother who just happened to practice all goddamn day while you at the club getting drunk. That's all it is. That's all I am. And in the end, you the guru. Everybody, everybody online, you the guru. Everybody in this class, you the guru. My job is just to help you think and process so you can benefit from the process. Let me read this next slide, and then we're going to go right into your question. Over the following year. So stop. They, did, they took these two teams, <laughs> of, uh, these two business teams. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, like shit. <laughs> this is too much stress. Shakita, you read. <laughs> uh, they took these. They took these businesses, and they wanted to run a test and to see how um, first principle thinking impacted businesses, right? Which I, I can tell you from somebody who uses it. Mashama uses it. Like me and him use it against each other all the time, and that's why I love him to death because. He doesn't let me get away with assumptions. And assumptions sometimes you can get to rolling, feeling yourself, because I do. Everybody will in this room will. And I just throw assumption in there real smooth. And Mashama be like, wait a minute, what, what did you say? And it'd be something really small, but that little small thing can change the whole outcome. So go ahead. Over the following year, <laughs> the startups in the control group averaged under $300 in revenue. The startups in the scientific thinking group averaged over $12,000 in revenue. So the ones who were practicing scientific thinking, right, which is analyzing, um, looking for knowledge, uh, first principle thinking, they made in one year $12,000 in revenue. The ones who were riding on their own assumptions, meaning they, they're using bad methodologies and bad models and driving them hard without questioning them, they made 300 Keep going. They brought in revenue more than twice as fast and attracted customers sooner too. This is this is gold, y'all. This is real. This is not this is not this is not the most self help ass books that be giving you this motivational speech. This is a formula. This is formula time. This is ain't this. I'm not inspiring none of you. I don't give a fuck about inspiration. I know I I, I probably I'm sure I'm probably tone forget the house right now. Hella mad. I ain't been inspired once. This is boring. He's probably at home just juggling. He's so fucking bored. Right? This ain't meant to, this is not meant to inspire not a person in this goddamn room. These are the tools now. We are tool level now. Let's roll. Why? <laughs> the entrepreneurs in the control group tended to stay wedded to their original strategies and products. Uh oh. It was this is what we always done. Uh uh, this is this is this always work. This is this is who I am. Wedded to their old strategies and products. Go ahead. It was too easy to preach the virtues of their past decisions. Mm, they said, they, what, they, what, they preaching again? Did you hear that word preaching again? They were preaching the virtues of this is how I got here. My mama died, my cousin, my spiritual enemy. Jesus talked to me last night when I was sleeping. He told me, sell this orange juice. And I ain't going to never change, Nana. Keep going. <laughs> oh, prosecute the vices of alternative options. Mm. And politic by catering to advisors who favored the existing direction. Wait a minute. Hey, you know, Shakina, that's this is why we're close friends. Because you see me. You know, like I, mean, I know Shabisha don't see me, but you know, this is why I ride with people like you, because we're on that different level. We, we're on a higher level. And when I tell you about my business, you understand it. She can't understand my business because she really just be hating on me anyway. And she be talking to me goddamn words. But you, girl, fuck what she fuck what you know. This is why I need a whole bunch of you in my life to reinforce what I think. I'm like that good guy who goes into the studio with all of his best friends and, and totally flops. Because I've been listening to all this fucked up ass feedback. Keep going. Whoa. Um, the, <laughs> the entrepreneurs who had been taught to think like scientists, in contrast, pivoted more than twice as often. When their hypotheses weren't supported, they knew it was time to rethink their business models. That's it. When you don't rethink your business models, let me explain to you what's going to happen to you in business. You're going to lose hope. You're going to get burnt out. Because what's going to happen is you're going to hit your head so many times you're going to think it's you. And then you're going to start thinking something's wrong with you. Then you're going to start to accept that maybe you're not meant for this. And then you're going to quit this game. 
It's that you just didn't, you didn't you didn't know that you had to change your model. You didn't know how to rethink. Your ego had you locked in on whatever the fuck you thought was right, and you stuck with it until you destroyed yourself. You weren't trying to re- like every day you're in business. You should be trying to replace stuff all the time. If everything's running well, replace something, improve something. You're in a constant system model upgrade game. It's not a game of keeping things the same. It's not a game of keeping things steady. Because the reason you can't keep it steady because nothing stays the same. The word same is counterintuitive because it's against everything you believe in. You're in a game of change. Nobody wants to be in a game of change. I don't like, I don't want a man changing me. That's who I am. That's what my mama was. That's why I was born like this. But you broke ass. You're in a game of change. You're in a game of change. That's what this game is about. You got your question? Because you got your question. I got a couple more to go. We can keep rolling? <laughs> keep rolling like. Because <laughs> we go, because because I'm bringing heat. I'm trying. I'm trying to give y'all. I'm giving y'all a game now. This is this is advanced thinking game. This is how to. I'm gonna get down to the nuts. Like so, first of all, I'm giving these core principles, which are gonna be principles you never heard. Then I'm getting to the nuts and bolts, how to use these principles. It's gonna keep getting like this is gonna be. You're gonna walk out of here if you wanted to be a cold blooded consultant. You would be cold blooded consultant. Let's see what time I got? How much time I got? Oh, yeah, I got time for one more slide, and then I'm we need questions to have, and we going home. I'm gonna stop here. I got a lot of material here. I'm just not getting started. And the cold part is I got I got three classes already ready to go because it's just and the three classes. It, this is all base. This ain't the, we ain't even hit the hard shit yet. It's gonna get deeper and deeper and deeper. But this is just gonna about to be fire. Okay, okay, hold on a second. Go ahead. So real quick, it's okay to be decisive. Some of y'all don't want to be decisive because y'all see it as a flaw. In business, it's okay to be deci- indecisive. It's, in, it's okay to be indecisive. In politics, that's a lie. It's a distortion. They're playing on human emotions to not be deci- indecisive. But a successful business person, anybody in power, has to always be willing to change their mind on the drop of a dime. And they're always questioning. Practice being indecisive. Stop trying to hold your ground. Stop trying to fight over points. Stop trying to argue points. Stop trying to say, I know this is what it is. Be like, huh, well, I believe it was this. That's fair. What information do you have? That's fair. But no, no, that's what it is. This is what I know. I can't begin, the more you realize how big this world really is, you sound like a goddamn fool. You don't really realize that some of the things you know it's only relevant for the last 10 years. You go back 30 years ago, the shit wasn't relevant, and the next 30 years it won't be relevant. Stop defending ideas. Know some basic things to be true. Do you love your family? Yes. You love yourself? Yes. Do you love your culture? Yes. Are you, do you want the best for your culture? Yes. Are you, trying to, are you trying to evolve life? Yes. If you're religious, do you love your God? Yes. After that, it changes shit. I'm talking about swap that shit so goddamn fast. Act like act like a Kim Kardashian at the Gucci store. Ooh, ooh. Just keep changing. Next one. Oh wait, wait, wait. we're gonna do the last one. The state of the, so we're going to factfulness. I just want to read this one opening one because we're gonna hit factfulness hard on this class. But we're gonna keep looping. We're gonna keep looping between principles because factfulness is full of so many principles. But he's giving you an example of how they work in the real world, which is code. And most people read this book. You guys read the surface, you can't read it without knowing these principles. Once I introduce the principles of what you've been reading, you're gonna realize, he gave me all this in this one book? Thankfulness is a foundation of thought. He just gave it through examples, and it's so cold-blooded, it's ridiculous. It's the invisible world you cannot see with your eyes. Your brain cannot see these things. Your television can't see it, and now the internet, because it pushes data to you, there's shit you cannot see. Last one. State the, the state of the world. People had a worldview dated to the time when their teachers had left school. So a lot of stuff you learned in school was based upon a worldview that was limited to that person's, their myopia. So it needs to be very clear. We have a, tr- remember you learn falsely to trust. So we're taught to trust our teachers, which is nothing wrong with that. 
but realize that teachers are victims to their own myopia, meaning that it is true within their time. But it gives you a very limited vi vision. That's why a lot of poverty teachers unconsciously teach poverty and don't even know it. Poverty teachers unconsciously teach poverty and don't even know it with the best intent because their, their thinking is limited. And because their thinking is limited, they give you the principles of poverty and you will go to, call, you will go to Stanford, get a degree, and still think poverty because it's the basis of how you think because you never practice rethinking. Finish, go. Here were people who had access to all the latest date, data and to advisors who could continuously update them. Their ignorance could not possibly be down to an outdated worldview. Yet even they were getting the basic facts about the world wrong. I'm going to stop here because I want to explain this one to you. You're running a company now. This is, this is, he's talking about worldview. But I want you to show how powerful this shit is. You're running a company and you got an a, a economic team and a behavior economic team, a behavior economic team analyzing data, extracting data, analyzing data. They, is including you, could distort the reading of the data, even though the data is the data. The data can tell you, oh, the reason you're having this problem is this. Your interpretation is the problem, not the data. Professional people who have data often falsify, their, they often draw the wrong correlation or conclusion because they bring their gut, their feelings, their thoughts, their distortions, distort the data that is not distorted. So having data doesn't mean, or the person who owns data, or the person who has access to data, or the person who's reading the book, or the person who wrote the book doesn't necessarily know, mean that they are qualified to teach you. This is so important, because some of you guys are seeking gurus. Are you giving people title trust automatically, and you're not using first principle thinking? This, is, this, this book is going to teach you so much about first principle thinking in the real world. It's crazy that you can't even question those individuals or your teacher because you're just following the assumption pattern. And then you fight often. If a messenger arrives one day in your path to give you new knowledge, you often reject the messenger who's carrying the truth because you're holding on to your loyalty to your trust. Your loyalty to your trust has already came and gone. It may have been relevant when they taught it at the end of its relevancy. But anybody tell you, when I first learned that all scientists, all, all forms of science is changing so fast that now as you learn this year can already be done, it could be totally different four years from now, nine years from now. That knowledge just doesn't, it's not like this is knowledge, so now it will reign forever. Because what makes knowledge also knowledge is contextual. If circumstances change, your knowledge change. Sadhguru was sitting with some people. I listen to Sadhguru because I think he's a hell of a wise dude. I'm not religious with him. Don't write with him. But I don't think he is either. I don't know what he is. But his, his brilliance is, is amazing. And if somebody asked him, what is the difference between Krishna and Jesus Christ? And people started to stay, oh, because Krishna was born in a royal family. He was more controlling, da 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 da, da. Christ is more poor. He was, you know, uh, he's born from a mother without a father, da 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 da. Krishna said, there's no differences. He said, wait, what? No differences? He said, you're focusing on them. You're not focusing on what they were born in. If you put Jesus in the same situation, he'd have to do the exact same thing. You put Krishna in the same situation, he'd have to do the same thing. How you show up and what is true is relevant to the circumstances that surround the truth. But when you look at truth purely as truth, that tunneling makes you ignorant to what is true. True has context tied to it. And so if you don't understand the content, the context, where the perspectives, the relativity to it, um, uh, the timing of it, um, then you don't understand truth at all. So when you guys are arguing truth and you have a poor relationship with truth, it's two fools arguing. It's two fools arguing. Like, it's different. You just want to, like, it's okay to argue for fun. Like, you know, you argue sports, you don't really care who wins. I mean, you care about your team, but you don't care also. So, if somebody like, I like to, like, when me, and, when me and Chris talk about the Lakers versus 
somebody because they don't win that much. But just say they we talk about the Lakers, right? And then when we're having, see, I got the microphone right now. Chris got the fingers. He like, when he gets back home, I'm about to be all full of jokes. And on text, he's probably tearing me up with my friends. But that's okay. But it's it's, it's the, um, but when we're playing like that, it has zero to do with my love for him. Zero. If y'all saw when he walked in the room, he's like my real blood brother. When I see him, I light up, right? And I'm going to still give him the jokes. And he's still going to give me his jokes. And I'm going to laugh hard at his jokes as if I said it to myself because that's that fun space. But when we're talking about stuff we don't know, that's, where, that's how we should all play. When we want to discover something new, then we should discover together. Right? Ain't nobody should be talking about success, arguing about success when nobody's successful. How are two broke-ass people talking about success? I don't understand. I don't understand what you're arguing about. It's, 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 like, it's like saying, is Pluto stronger than Mickey Mouse? I don't know. But it's fun to talk about. Let's have some fun. But when, to the point that you have to start my mouth about, I, I wish a motherfucker would tell me about Pluto again because he don't respect me. What? You mad because he said Pluto's weak? And you, you done left lunch and you done left the food behind, your drink's still sitting there fresh, ready to go, and you walking out there hungry and thirsty as hell to the point that when you talk ashes is coming out of your mouth because you mad because he said Pluto's weak? Are you fucking serious? This shows you the distortion of the brain. I'm doing this to show you how silly we sound in some of these discussions I'm listening to all the time. I'm thinking, well, we don't know, and let's discover. If we discover... There's really no argument if we discover. There's only an argument because somebody's defending, somebody's preaching, and somebody's been a politician. With that being said, any questions before we go home? Shakita's like, Shakita unloaded that question. Like, she, shh, I got one. <laughs> go ahead, Shakita. Oh, gosh, Nana. Um... My question is, how do we decipher the difference between popular opinion and heuristics? Do we literally call it out in the moment or do we take a mental note? Because I'm struggling to think um, if I can call it out in secret because I have blind spots and biases of my own. Well, popular, if you use those five questions, that's how you do it. Those five questions, is it true? I'm not sure if you went to the bathroom or doing it. Those five questions that we posted, that's how you discover it. Because if you just rely upon your feelings, you can't. Heuristics are are things that we know, they're not really the same thing. Heuristics are things that don't really require deep thought. Like one plus one, two, I'm not using my brain for that. I don't think I'll even burn half a calorie for that, right? But if I say what's 17 times 447, I'm gonna burn a lot of calories for that, right? So that's when my second, my second, my subconscious, there's a, there's a, mind you, that's some distortion around that because once you learn neuroscience, he just used that to illustrate how the brain worked, but once you learn how the brain works, that's not how the brain works. But you burn calories when you have to go over those harder numbers, right? So that's the separation. That's how that works. Um, we could be on autopilot. Like when you drive a car, you're on autopilot. It doesn't mean you're driving a car wrong. But when you take a car to a mechanic, he asks you first principle questions to try to figure out what problem you're having. He can't just say, you can't come in and be like, man, my car acted up. Be like, he's acting up. Oh, it's be $700. Leave it right here. He has to go into a whole different process of, getting past his own personal, even if he listens to it, he'll say, well, let me put it on the computer also to look at the data to see if it's just my bias, my perception is distorted, this car is different than the last car, each year they could put new parts on there, I don't know what the original person who designed this was thinking. So, learning to start listening for assumptions, when you say, no, see, black people usually, assumption, do A, B, and C, assumption, so why I did it, is because I thought assumption, because you use the words, I'm making an assumption, that this would be a successful assumption. That's all assumptions. And then when you go back and examine it, you realize, I didn't know what the hell I was doing at all. Go back to that story I said, Michael jumped in his car to take his dog to the beach. And I go, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. No, you assumed. You don't know what the hell I just said. Because you didn't know what race Michael was, how old Michael was, what, uh, what time of day Michael left the house. You didn't know what kind of car he got in. You didn't know what kind of dog he had. You didn't know what beach he went to. You filled it with assumptions. And that's okay if we're just shooting the shit and talking and having, you know, every day. It doesn't work when you're trying to get shit done or you're doing something that's very serious for yourself. You buy a house, turn those assumptions off. You make a decision for your business, turn that assumption off. You're working with your child and trying to guide them in some direction, turn that assumption off. If you're trying to improve yourself, turn your assumptions off. 
and it slows you down because it's a drag out process of asking questions, but it's a necessary must for change. Otherwise, you think you're changing. Then you call it biases, that other word. You think you're changing, and the reason you think you're changing is because you never challenged your assumptions. You thought if you just took out one chunk and replaced it with another chunk, you changed. But you left all the assumptions in place, meaning that you just took the new chunk and made it work the way the old chunk worked. So that answered part of my question, um, the front half, but then the second half of it being... Um, like, because I know there's a difference, because I, I phrased that in the question, you know, that there, there being a difference in how to identify that. But the second part of the question was, um, like, after asking questions, like, is that something that you identify, like, oh, you know, I just realized that I just got caught up in popular thinking and, and, and like, in popular opinion, or... I would say, that, I would say this... Or is it like I, something that When I make a decision, mm -hmm. and whether it disrupts or changes things, I go, I don't know that's true. Where did I get that from? But you're having an internal conversation yes. or an external conversation? Internal. Okay. And then what I'm doing in practice is I listen to other people's assumptions to hear my assumptions. So I may hear you talk and go, hmm, assumption, assumption, hmm, assumption, assumption. And I won't say anything until you say, can you help me? Mm -hmm. And then I go all the way back to that first assumption and go, how you know that's true? How you know that's true? How you know that's true? Mm -hmm. And when you give human beings the rain and, and help them own their own process and see their own journey, they start to fix their own path. Who's next person? How do you find the balance between negative mental filtering and ego? Because it seems like they're kind of intertwined. They are intertwined. And a lot of them comes from the, the, the reality of, of, of both of those. They both, okay, so one is, a dist one, okay, they're intertwined, but they're different. So the, the filtering is a distortion. So you have, to, you have to tell yourself, it's okay to have a feeling, but you have to be able to tell yourself that's not true. And over time, you, you, through habitual calling yourself out, you adjust, right? Because what happens is when you feel it's true, there's a lot of other stuff that goes along with it. It starts to build itself out. You start the building process by saying, you know, that's, like I say it all the time. So I have distortions happen all the time. When something happened, I'm like, no, that's not true. There was, a, there was a month I didn't want to ride my motorcycles because I saw somebody get killed on a freeway. So my brain started to overgeneralize and say, yo, that could happen to me next, right? Even though you look at the numbers. So what I did is I went to the numbers to calm my brain down because I knew what was going on. My brain was going crazy. Then I had to talk myself off my own cliff. Nana, nah, that's not true. Nana, nah, nah, go, go for a ride right now. Go for a ride right now. Turn the news off because all you're going to be doing is looking for confirmation bias, finding other people who did that, right? So that's, that's one of the things you have to sometimes talk yourself off. Ego, the real, the real reverse of ego is self-love. And self-love, this is, okay, conscious folks kind of had it, but they just kind of went too far into some extreme. Learn to love yourself naked. Everything about yourself. Learn to see the beauty in it. One of the things that, <laughs> I know this is going to sound so weird. When I was younger. <laughs> oh, shit. Of course, story's still better than mine. So anyway, when I was younger, you know what helped me? find myself attractive? <laughs> Biggie Smalls. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, like, hey, I look at Biggie Smalls, I'm like, yo, like, people like Biggie Smalls. I know he's a few other people like him I was coming up. Started when I was, like, 20, 19, 20. This one dude, he had the baddest woman. Like, she was the baddest, like, we saw in that part of Oakland, period, hands down. This dude's the ugliest I've ever seen in Oakland, Hands down. And, like, I'm a dude, so I can't really measure dudes how attractive. Like, I can, I can just see if you're ugly or you must be attractive, right? But I can't be like, yo, you hella fine. I can't. I really can't see that. I know that women think, oh, you're homophobic. Ain't got no homophobic. My brain just ain't trained to see that. But this dude was hella ugly, though. You're like, you see him, you're like, ooh, hard to look at you, bro. You're like, just. Like, if somebody said you were alien, I'd be like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew he's alien. <laughs> but, 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 I just didn't sound like shit. But there was a lesson for me, right? <laughs> the lesson was, dude, stop trying to change the way you look. Learn this, like, if he can get hurt, then fuck, who, 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 who can you get? Who can you get? Because you must be cool then, right? And you start realizing, oh, it ain't about that superficial stuff. Matter of fact, once you buy into these ideas of what you should be, you don't realize you joined a superficial team that dooms you also. 
Once you learn to love your fat lips, your big round nose, them big ass ears, that big ass head, uh, that the little small ass orange you call buff, there's somebody who really loves your shit. There's somebody who really loves that. And what happens is you keep going to the people who want, you know, small, small noses, and you don't realize you don't want them once you get them. So once you learn to love yourself and realize that the world, the world is beautiful because it's imperfect. Perfection makes you ugly. Another lesson I learned when I was in eighth grade, I did this girl named Sonia Johnson. Sonia Johnson was fine as hell. Sonia Johnson was so fine, she got on a bus and I forgot to breathe to the point that I thought almost like it was like an asthma attack. I literally forgot to breathe. And when we started dating and stuff, she was finest. I mean, I would look at her like, like, God, if I die today, you show me the most beautiful thing in the world. Two weeks later, I was looking at another woman. She became, she became average to my eyes. I realized that beauty doesn't have much value. What has more value is the development of your character, who you are. Your self-love and confidence makes you beautiful, not your physical body. Your lack of accomplishments, it's because you just didn't know. You were just born in a circumstance of things you didn't know. But you don't realize all your traumas made you more powerful because that characteristic that it built in you gave you an advantage on your competition. My son is going through something right now. My son has a tendency to go extremely to the right too far. He's extremist. I ain't playing. Extremist. But wasn't Michael Jordan extremist? It's when you don't know how to harness those gifts and you demonize those gifts, then they become your enemy. When you learn to accept and love yourself, those weaknesses become your strengths. You have the ability to flip it. It's a mental distortion that's keeping you down. So as you increase your self-love, your ego calms down. Now, there's a certain part of your ego that never calms down. You're going to have to talk it off the cliff sometimes. You're going to be like, man, I'm a boss. I don't need to hear this shit. And you be like, that was some stupid shit. You need to hear this. Right? Or, oh, you better not tell me. I know you better not tell me. There's an old story I think the Bible said, I sent all these different people to you, you still didn't hear them. Sometimes you don't get to tell knowledge where to come from. And so a lot of times your ego will sometimes say, you can't tell me, but you can. I listened to him because he was brilliant, but I ain't listening to your ass. Right? It's changing your relationship to yourself is what helps your ego calm down. And then you too practice humility and be around other people who talk humility. Most black people in the community don't talk humility. So I know how to get just enough of some people and back the fuck up off of them because if I stay around them too long, I had a person that used to talk, talk with their broke asses. That's where I got that frame from, that, 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 those frame of words from. He used to say everybody was broke, right? But I also watched who he was as a person, and he had to belittle everybody else to make himself feel better. Also, you know you're becoming stronger when you can celebrate greatness in your presence. I see court, I see greatness doesn't mean I see perfection, two different things. I see greatness. Every time I get a chance to celebrate him, I don't miss a chance. The reason I celebrate greatness, I look for greatness in everybody. If I talk to you, I'm going to talk about your greatness. That says a lot about you. But if you're at home gossiping a lot, you're destroying yourself. You're like, you know what she said? You know what he said? Oh, my God, that shit was hella stupid. You're destroying yourself. You can talk about others to learn or to try to translate their different perspectives. It doesn't work for you when you put people down. So I don't know, like I don't know your personal life, so there's no, there's no judgment in anything I said. There's no personalization. But ego often comes from self-hatred. Self, not, not, not enough of self-love. As you increase your love, it tames a little bit of ego, but then some of it is always going to be manual for the rest of your life. You being black in America, you don't get to override the branding of being called a minority. That impacts you. Don't think if somebody calls you a minority every day. That don't affect you. Because what they just did was they changed your status. They said, this is a big-ass world, and you're down here. And if you accept that, your ego is going to be up here. That's just how it is. I'm a black woman who ain't got that much. I just shrunk you. I don't get to shrink you. Don't let nobody ever shrink you. You're a bad mother. I'm just talking about you. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I had two questions. One, um, since I'm new to the class and learning how to how to do the homework or how to structure it, in this class I heard you speak about three books. It was yes. Psychology of Money, Mental Modes, and Factualness. So, Tanil, Tanil has an email. Just get with her after class because she's sending it out to everybody, but maybe you're not on the list. Let's get you on the list. Go ahead. Am I supposed to read 
all of them? Am I reading like oh, read yeah. this one in the morning, this one in the afternoon, this one at night? Matter of <laughs> fact, you want to be honest with you? You yeah. want to be honest with you? <laughs> if you put in an hour a day, you'd be done with them all in about two and a half weeks. An hour a day. Five days a week. Take two days off and, um, and chill. Here's the thing. What is deeper about that is this. If I told you, yo, you, let's go back to the NBA. Yo, you want to practice at least six, eight, eight hours a day. How many hours do you want the NBA not? What do you want? Like, I, I, I'm like, you guys are bidding to be the elite. When you run a company, I got it. When you run a company, you are choosing to be elite. When you become a leader, you're choosing to be elite. Stop saying you want to be elite, but approach life very mediocre. Mediocrity is not your friend if you want to be elite. You got to start learning how to do elite shit. Elite shit is elite pain. See, it, like somebody, like if Cassandra, uh, Shakina, Shakina's crazy. The, Shakina practices elite pain. So she gets elite results. Some of y'all practice passive pain. And you know, who you, you know your fat ass when I talk about you. I ain't going to say who you are. But you don't practice no pain at all. You can't wait to sit down with a sandwich. And it better taste right. It better have everything I want because I ain't want no pain of what I don't want. I need all pleasure, baby. Life fucked up, ain't it? You came here through pain. You will leave here through pain. If you want to rise, it's going to be pain. Don't play mediocrity and softness to be great. If you want to do great shit, then be prepared for the pain that goes along with it. That's why you celebrate great people, because you know they've been through some shit. Great people are not lucky chosen because they the, lot the lottery winners and they scratched off success. Them motherfuckers did some shit. So, yep, one hour a day. Anything else? Um, yeah, so I heard you say, how do we turn like turn off your emotions? No, no, you can't turn off your emotions. Oh, it's okay. Strong emotional responses, controlling strong emotional responses. So you know how black folks, we, we, go, we go there? Right? Like I say, if I, if I irritate you and, and you didn't know me from the streets, and you know how it is, you know what I'm talking about. You know. um, turn it off. Doesn't mean you don't feel the anger. But process the anger. Sit with the anger. Make sure the anger makes sense to you. Wise people move slower than, than fools. Fools move quick to their emotions. Create that space between, court taught this, between emotion and the response. A fool has no space. I wish a motherfucker would It'd make me mad I'm slapping. I don't understand why I'm sitting in this prison cell. That's messed up, messed up my life. I'm intelligent. Okay, pass on. Remember, you don't become successful because of intelligence, you can become successful because of behavior. Your question. I got two. The mm -hmm. first one is going back to mental filtering. Mm -hmm. I understand the cognitive distortion of it, but I feel like I use it as a tool to check myself because if, if everyone says, oh, that's good, that's great, then I might drink the Kool-Aid. Because you have because you don't know what you're doing, you're living in a world of, 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 of um, make-believe thoughts. If I believe this, I might fail. If I don't believe this, I might win. There's no strategy there. It's all, you feel, it's almost like, you're, the child in you is still wishing for a star. And if you wish too hard, it might not come. There's no logic there. That's just all, those are all m cultural myths. That's what we talked about earlier, right? It's okay because, remember I said to, I think it was Lily the other day, if you're gonna climb, you gotta look up, don't look down. So if somebody gives you a compliment, thank you, but I'm still gonna go up, right? You don't, like, it's, it's when you over celebrate the compliment as if you arrived, that's a flaw. But receive the compliments, but you turn them into motivations to continue to climb up because you're never going to arrive. The distortion that you arrive is when you start to fail because you become outdated because you start to settle in on what you know. you confident. You start rethinking. You start thinking. You start assuming. All these things start to kick in, and you start to poison yourself back to the ground. So all this, all this fear of, I don't want to do this because this might mean this, that's an assumption based upon what? Right, and I'm, I'm just trying to control my expectations. Your expectations are even flawed. 
because sometimes your assumptions of your expectations, I'm trying to move you guys away from that. These are traditional cultural things we do, but they're based upon, we've been coping all these years without knowledge. We've survived this long without knowledge. Well, how do you think we got here? Through those kind of methodologies, these distortions, right? At some point, where am I? Where do I need to go? If you know what you need to do tomorrow, and I'd be like, yo, you saw how many? You're like, yeah, but I gotta go back to work because I got shit to do because I gotta deliver this tomorrow. You know where you need to go. So the, the so the motivate the compliment comes in the right place and you have the right response to it because you know where you gotta go. But if you're not sure where you gotta go and you're not sure where you came from, the compliment is like, don't mess up my luck. Don't don't fuck with anything, because it's working right now. You ever see old people like don't touch my goddamn computer because you might mess it up? Because <laughs> they don't know how to fix it. They don't know how to work. With it. They don't know anything about technology. As you change your relationship to life and change your position and take ownership back, this information, what I'm about to teach you, and I'm teach you how to read now. Now, okay, after six months, I didn't take you to the finish line. I introduced you to a new level of information, and I can go back and give you one of these books you probably read before. And you'll be like, this book sucks, because it's gonna. They're gonna try to frame themselves as the guru. What you need is books that are taking these, this new level of thought and then taking you some other places with it. So I'm introducing you to a whole different way of thinking. So no, no, let the distortion go. And then once you let it go, now what do I use to replace it is the question, not protecting the distortion. Thank you. Yeah. The other part is, um, and I, I don't know if you gave me the answer when you said listen to the assumptions but not sitting at the table at Buy to Media anymore and sitting amongst other entrepreneurs who are not tapped into this, I am finding myself unable to listen to feelings, like in a way where it may be coming across as rude. I'm extremely focused on action. Um, I don't, I don't want to hear about how you feel or what you think if it's not accurate. Because a lot of business is relationship, I'm trying to um, navigate this. And so is it to listen for the assumption in the conversation? Or I, And I know you've been there, so what is what is? So here's a trick, here's a trick. Because you still need them. You didn't buy your products. They have value to you. If they buy your products tomorrow, don't they have value? If I, buy, if, I buy a, if I become a vendor and I buy all your products, even though I'm, I'm on some emotional, feely, fluffy, disconnected, non-performing stuff, am I still valuable? Stay focused on my value. No, you're not supposed to listen to it. You can, well, you can listen to them. Okay. Being kind to human beings don't mean being right. Being kind is letting you say what you have to say, but also controlling the space that you share with somebody. Right? If I, like, for example, I got friends who just want to give everybody advice. They ain't this shit. They won't give everybody advice. I get, let them have that space because what I'm setting them up for is the exchange. See, I got I to keep the pipelines open because at some point you may become the teacher. But if you've removed yourself from everybody, then you made yourself inaccessible or people can't relate to you. Not because they can't, it's because you kind of shoot them away. As you grow in this new knowledge, it's going to make it worse times a thousand. But it should also grow your empathy and compassion for other people. I probably love people more now than I did when I had half this amount of information. Because you start to see value, different values in people. Like, they might be right for where they are. Just like, that's like me, that's like you talking to me right now, I'd be like, oh, this motherfucker, she asks these dumbass questions. She should know that shit. I know that shit. I wouldn't ask that dumbass question. I'm not qualified to work. I'm not qualified. There's no love in that, right? Where you are is brilliant. Where Kaji is is brilliant. Well, Shabisha is brilliant. I don't say, oh, you don't see what I see? There's, there's a post in our group where somebody said some real motivational shit. And I, get, I have to prove a post, but I forgot to prove it in a week. And I proved it. It was corny as hell. To me, it's corny as hell to him. It's corny as hell to her. It's corny as hell to uh, Chris, right? Because they got businesses. It's probably corny to you even. But for Lily, that shit like, whoa, that's tight. Because what she is in her evolution. But Lily won't be there if she's, if she's aligned with life. Nobody's meant to be anywhere for long. She's there today. If she's the same place next year, she's failed herself. That's simple. 
It's that simple. So everybody you saw that room is evolving. Now, when they give you advice, get out of those rooms. Don't put yourself in those rooms. Show up in those rooms, give love, hugs. Hey, I love y'all. Hey, that was powerful what you said. Let me add that to this. I'm out. But if you stay in that room, you can't. Once a certain degree of separation happens, and that person is blocked by the ego, prosecutor, politician, and um, preacher, all you're prepared to do is fight you. So you serve them no value. Learn to show up with love, give hugs, and get the fuck up out of here. But don't put yourself... I would never go in a room with ground one entrepreneurs. It's too much work for me. It beats me up. I literally... I just had a discussion with a client who happens to be spending money who's a ground one entrepreneur company that works with ground one entrepreneurs, and he came in just pitching these horrible ideas. And it was all sitting, all flexing. Yeah, because, you know, it's just... It's, you know, and using all fancy words, saying not a goddamn thing. And then by the time they left the room, he's like, I don't even know what to think anymore. I'm like, yeah, you don't know. You didn't know what you think when you first walked in here. What's different? Hey, Nana, that's how we was in Tulsa the whole time. We had to be like that. We left. Yeah, we did, perfect example. When we was in Tulsa, we were around ground 0.2 entrepreneurs. Matter of fact, you might say negative two entrepreneurs. I didn't go into those meetings because I didn't want to hurt people. Feel, look, what y'all doing is what y'all doing because at some point I was really low. Now that at the age of 17 think he's going to be an entrepreneur, oh boy. Ego like a motherfucker, now it's like zero, right? But my ego said I was the guru. If Tony Robbins just sit down, I could run this whole nation. Actually, I thought like that when I was five. I'm not even lying to y'all. I thought I could run the nation at five. I'm not even exaggerating you. 2% my ego was crazy at a young age, right? We in Tulsa, once we recognized the, the huge gap, all I did was walked around, gave people hugs, if somebody said, can you help me, I gave them attention. If they didn't say, can you help me, I was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Or what I would, uh, and okay, here's the superpower, but you, you, take your time to get to this one. I would just turn into a, a simple question that would just disrupt everything. Well, how do you feel about that? No one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> I'm like, shit. Okay, that one works. That works, but don't do it anymore. Don't do that one no more, right? I mean, I literally had people crying on my shoulders, and I and all I kept doing was just trying to tell them like, "Hey, you're okay. Where you are is good. Try to change a little bit." Because the reality is, if you tell somebody to go from one to ten, they've already failed. You should go from one to one point five. That's what they can really do. And if the attention span is low, one to one point one. So the, when you when you really get into like people focus, you realize that your knowledge that you're investing in. Steph Curry can't put too much time into Nana playing basketball at 24-hour fitness. He just can't. At some point, he has to accept that Nana ain't going to be good. Nana's not coming to the NBA. Nana don't practice like that. Nana's too old. Nana's too buff. Nana breaks too many basketballs. We're not doing this. But if you just want to play and be cool with me, he might be like, yo, man, keep practicing, man. You know, hey, man, you never know. You might, you know, no matter how far you go, he won't tell me what I can't do. Because he doesn't know that. But what he'll tell me is that you never know how far you go. He might tell me, hey, when you practice that, you don't, have you ever tried this? Hey, you should try that. And he's out. He goes to there and be like, yo, do it again. Do it again. Oh, my God. You can't get this shit right for nothing. He's not. He's a fool. You see what I'm going with this? This people game is love people first. People are better than you think. There's more good people than bad people in this world. They just make bad, distorted decisions. When you start from that, people become this cool thing you want to discover, not judge. I told my last, my last point that we closing out. My neighbor came to me the other day. This is way too late. Josh, you're going to run real fast. I'm going to burn some skin off you. You're going to get there when I get there with you. Um, my neighbor came to me the other day. He's a hardcore Christian. Hard. I'm talking about he'll make pastor like a Christian, pastor, Christian like a sinner because he's, he's a fundamentalist. So he's Christian, Christians, Christians. Uh, he probably be giving Jesus advice. He's so Christian. <laughs> uh, I'm not like, he's super Christian. Anyway, um, so he comes across the street. He's like, you know, I have a hard time judging. I said, then you're a fool. How can you judge when you can't know everything? Curiosity is the only way you can be great. The reason the Bible told you don't be a judge, don't stop judging, because judging makes you a fool. All you're doing is projecting your ignorance on everybody. This is what you should do. You should do. This is what you should think. I said, in order for you to even learn your Bible, you can't even learn your Bible if you're judging. You only can learn your Bible if you become curious. Live through curiosity, not judgment. So when I run around people, I don't judge folks. I'm more curious now. 
because the, even the most ignorant person in the room has something for me to learn from. With that being said, next week we turning this shit up. We ain't stopping. Y'all think I'm playing? I ain't playing with y'all. I ain't playing with none of y'all. Anyway, see y'all next week. Have a good night. As they say in Brooklyn, we out of here.